Hello, and welcome to our 13th lecture on pagans and Christians. Tonight, we are going to move chronologically towards the um, uh, beginning of the 5th century. And uh, we will pick up with one of the characters that we met last week, that is Alaric the Goth, who will ultimately lead a successful campaign against the city of Rome and actually sack the city of Rome in the year 410. And we're going to see that that moment, that critical moment of the sacking of the imperial capital for the first time in 1,000 years was uh, the kind of um, conditional cause of the writing of one of the greatest pieces of Christian literature ever in Western history, and that is The City of God by St. Augustine, which we're going to examine in some detail, the first 10 books of it. It's a very long work, very complicated work, and uh, we will not be looking at anything beyond the first 10 books, but uh, that they are actually the perfect um, uh, subjects for our course together on the interactions between paganism and Christianity. And indeed, St. Augustine is really one of the greatest minds to have ever lived. And so what I'm going to begin with doing tonight is to uh, introduce him and uh, talk a little bit about his person, his uh, some of the major contours of his life, his very long and, and um, an interesting life. And then we will uh, watch a short video on the sacking of, the Ro of Rome itself, and then we will start looking into the, uh, the text itself. Okay, so to begin with, in Augustine, we have and we see the fortuitous confluence of eventful epoch and great mind. As the historian and convert to the Orthodox Church, Yaroslav Pelikan once wrote, Augustine was, if not the greatest Latin writer, then at least the greatest person ever to write Latin. But if you've heard about St. Augustine at all, it's likely that you have heard some collection of several platitudes about him, that he was, for instance, a metaphysical dualist, and a, uh, that he expressed an escapist animus toward material creation, that he taught a juridical morality of guilt that also subjugated humans under the providence of a puppet master god, and that he is fundamentally and politically an anti-democratic thinker, an authoritarian, who gave his highest moral imprimatur to the coercion of the Middle Ages that culminated in the Holy Inquisition. All of these are crucial for understanding Augustine and for understanding his book, The City of God, yet all are crucially wrong, I think. Um, however, each does touch on something important in Augustine's writing, some crucial theme or facet, and so we should be attentive to them. The best way to see where they come from is to see what parts of his life sparked each, and that is what we will do here. I want to map out his life in three big stages. First of all, we'll see that in his youth he had been an ambitious pagan Roman rhetor, that is an orator, probably a Neoplatonist in his sympathies, and an interested disciple of another Oriental religion, that is Manichaeism or Manichaeanism, uh, and this background is the source of the metaphysical charges against him, that is, of dualism. Secondly, we will see that for most of his adulthood, he was simultaneously a monk, a bishop, and more broadly, a church leader, and this background is the source of the moral charges against him, um, uh, the second of the moral charges that I mentioned. And finally, after his death, as he anticipated, he quickly took on a fourth identity, namely the legacy of the whole Western Latin church. And this background explains the political charges against him. So to begin with, he was born in 354 in Tagaste in Roman North Africa, a medium-sized provincial town in the farming heartland of the Roman Empire, a place of small farmers, wealthy landowners, and serious religious conservatives, suspicious of the urbanites and cosmopolitanism of Italy and the or Greek Orient. It was in some ways a cultural backwater of the empire, but in other ways, the heartland. His father, Patricius, was originally a Roman. We don't know if his family came over themselves uh, from Rome or if he came over on his own, but he was Roman. His mother, Monica, however, might have been from North African stock, that is of Berber stock, and 
Um, while Patricius was not a Christian, at least not until his deathbed conversion, Monica most definitely was, uh, and ultimately would become a saint, in fact. Now, Augustine was not baptized as a child. Evidently, his parents either disagreed about this or they held to the very common practice at that time of baptism being performed only at death's door. Augustine was given a good education, though, and he responded very well. As a promising youth, he was actually sponsored by wealthy people in Tagaste uh, to go to Carthage to study further. And despite his own re recollections in his confessions of his sinful youth, of course, stealing pears which uh, from a neighbor's orchard and, uh, with friends that he uses as kind of a metaphor for a fallen nature in general and running wild in the streets, um, he wasn't a party animal in the frat boy sense. He was certainly a driven young man on the go. He did have a lover, though, a longtime common law wife whose name he never reveals, but she gave him a son, Adeodatus. Significantly, this name, Adeodatus, means given by God. So Augustine was clearly thinking about God before becoming a Christian. It's also significant that Adeodatus was born in about the year 371 or 372, that same period when Patricius, his father, died when Augustine was about 18 years old. Augustine sent his common law wife, his concubine, live in girlfriend, whatever you want to call her, um, and uh, Adeodatus is, this is the same woman who was Adeodatus's mother, he sent her away. Uh, uh, from them soon before his conversion as part of his mother's plan to get him to marry into a noble Roman family. We know nothing more of this woman, and Adeodatus himself would actually die at the young age of 17 in 390, soon after he and his father had been baptized. It is one of the silent mysteries of Augustine, one of the influences we'll never be able to quantify or measure, that everything we have by him, everything that he wrote, was the product of the mind of a father of a dead, much beloved son, and a one-time, um, can't say husband really, but of one who was almost a husband, uh, of a wife that he sent painfully away from himself. From his training as a teacher, of rhetoric, he learned above all a certain picture of moral formation, of what it means to become a fully civilized man. And man it was, uh, Augustine's world was deeply sexist. But while Augustine would come in his own ways to challenge that patriarchy on its edges, insisting on, for instance, women's full capacities as reasoners and bearers of the image of God, guided, no doubt, by the respect he always held for his mother, Monica, he basically agreed that women were to be regarded physically as weaker versions of men, but he did insist that they were in no way qualitatively different from them. This is one of, of course, the, the big differences between classical civilization and Christianity. Um, Christianity ushers in uh, our, our concepts that we take for granted of the equality of the sexes. Rhetoric was not simply one discipline among others in Roman education. It was the basis, really, of education, as we've talked about many times before. The aim of education was not simply the delivery of data or information to a student, but it was moral formation, to become a certain kind of person. To be thus educated meant to be civilized, and this forming required rhetoric, as it was said by Cato the Elder in a much uh, beloved phrase throughout all of Roman education subsequently, education was meant to create a vir bonus peritus decendi, a good man skilled in speaking. That really kind of sums it all up. And Augustine learned that the model orator gave speeches which oriented his listeners' attention, agitated their feelings, and then would move them to some action, all the while, of course, pleasing their intellectual and aesthetic natures. To be educated was thus to be able both to move and to be moved by such rhetoric, such beauty, to feel the right sorts of things in the right way, to have tastes, values, um, and then to act on those feelings, okay? the inculcation of certain values, certain tastes, and the ability to both appreciate them and to replicate them in one's own writing 
and speaking. Augustine's studies and teaching went well, and he moved up the academic ranks eventually. In 384, around 30 years old, he made it to Milan, um, the western capital of the Roman Empire, where he prospered as a rhetor, a, uh, as a kind of college professor of the arts of rhetoric as a whole. All this time, he had been involved in some way with a religion known as Manichaeanism that we have talked about before, which shared with his later Christianity a deep resonance with those Neoplatonic beliefs about the lesser quality of being of material reality and the idea that truth lies deeply inside of us in the most spiritual part of our beings. From his time with this religious group and other dalliances with Neoplatonism, um, as well as from Roman culture as a whole, he learned an appreciation of contemplation, quiet, peace, retreat, and a deep suspicion of noise, turbulence, and change. He learned from the Manichees also the idea that behind this world there is another, truer, deeper one. So we must practice strategies of resistance to the idea that our sensory experience of the world is comprehensively exhaustive of all reality. And of course, this is a platonic insight. Plato's allegory of the cave in the Republic, you remember, um, uh, is a great example of just this sort of thing, maybe the Ur example of it, actually. Uh, you remember that story suggests that our ordinary perception of the world is actually the perception of a flickering and shadowy representation of some reality presented to us mostly in a dim lit space of this world, when we actually end up seeing things in their proper light, Plato argues, we are initially disordered, uh, disoriented and part, partly blinded. So unprepared are we to see the world as it really is. So much of our training in this world, much of our education is to begin to prepare us for those situations in which we see rightly, to begin to help us to see how to train ourselves, even here and now to see rightly in the present as well as in the future. And at times this requires a certain kind of disorientation in the present so that we will be properly oriented in the future. You can see how rhetorical formation um, and the ambition that came with that uh, as, a, as a practicer of rhetoric meshed so well with his Platonist and Manichaean kind of sensibilities here. But Augustine was not satisfied with Manichaeanism. He had had doubts about it for some time, in fact, but in, in Milan, he met and listened to St. Ambrose, the Christian bishop of the city, and he found in him a congenial way of being a Christian um, and also being an intellectual. He, St. Augustine says in his eloquent, in his, in his confessions, quote, by his eloquent sermons in those days, he zealously provided your people, this is a prayer to God, with the, with the fat of your wheat, the gladness of your oil, and the sobering intoxication of your wine. All no, unknowing, I was led to him by you, so that through him I might be led while fully knowing it to you. That man of God received me in fatherly fashion, and as an exemplary bishop, he welcomed my pilgrimage. I began to love him, at first not as a teacher of the truth, which I utterly despaired of finding in your church, but as a man who was kindly disposed towards me. I listened carefully to him as he preached to the people, not with the intention I should have had, but to try out his eloquence, as it were, and to see whether it came up to its reputation. Because of the relationship that St. Augustine and St. Ambrose formed, and uh, and because of his growing disaffection for the Manichees, Augustine finally converted to Christianity and was baptized on Easter weekend of 387. Uh, and he left his post as a rhetoric teacher and retreated to a villa with his friends, his son, and his mother, Monica. It is, this, it is his time with the Manichees and his Platonism more broadly that people blame for what they see as his dualism, that is, in his case, what they see as a belief that people are souls embedded in bodies that are, strictly speaking, accidental to their being. Uh, and for what other critics see as his anti-materialism, that is, what they claim is his overt hostility toward the idea of the material world and that this world is not worth very much. Now, we'll see over the course 
of our discussions uh, today and our next lecture that neither of these understandings of his thought are very accurate. He rejected both the Manichaeans and the Platonists in favor of true uh, biblical Christianity. Um, and his reasons for doing so were precisely since neither properly valued the human body or the material world, both of which the Bible says are very good. Eventually, he made his way back to, from Milan to North Africa and set up a religious community in Tagaste and became a sort of monk living an austere life of prayer, poverty, and community with his friends. The North African Christianity of his day, uh, what he saw of it in his youth and what he led of it in his maturity, uh, was rather unique in some ways, uh, rather unlike Christianity in other places um, in some important ways. It held, for instance, a deeply hardcore group of believers, unmoved by and suspicious of the doctrinal disputes that got the Greeks and the Egyptians uh, and all of those urbane Greek-speaking Eastern Mediterraneans all riled up. Uh, for them, that is for these North African Christians, moral and religious seriousness was measured by suffering and endurance. It was a good context, really, for thinking of the Christian life as one of ascetic commitment, and that is precisely what Augustine did. His monasticism was not a traditional one, for he decided to be a monk in the city instead of the traditional location of the desert. And I'll say as a general tendency, that is a distinction between Eastern and Western monasticism at this time. The East tends to have hermits in the desert, even very large monasteries, but always apart from everyone else, uh, apart from the cities. Whereas in the West, they tend to be more fixed in the urban centers. Um, his decision to do so, that is to live in the city, was, uh, was because he felt that it was the appropriate place for religious life. It meant that he thought the intensity of the dedicated religious life was best carried out not in the desert's austere isolation, at least for himself, far from ordinary people, but instead in the all too human noise and bustle of the city where the monks could be seen um, and known. And this reflects, of course, a theme will be, uh, that we'll see expressed throughout the city of God, namely that Augustine had a deep and abiding suspicion of property that was private and privacy in general. And he insisted on holding things in common as a community and on being open about his own and that community's weaknesses, even when those things caused them embarrassment. God already sees our frailties, he would say. You can imagine him uh, uh, um, explaining this to the people. So why would we care if others do as well? Perhaps they can be dissuaded from repeating the errors that we so publicly make if they see the consequences of us making them. Well, things changed for Augustine in 391, when during a church service while visiting the coastal city of Hippo Regius, Augustine was compelled by the community, prompted by their bishop, to accept ordination in the, their diocese with the clear intent that he would become the city's new bishop. He agreed he would be their bishop, but he would never be he would never cease to be monastic, living in a community with his avowed brethren. And so he moved his religious community from Tagaste to Hippo, and throughout his life, even as bishop, he lived amidst it. Augustine would live out his days in Hippo. He traveled all over North Africa, but the city remained his home. He became what is known as a coadjutor bishop in 395, and then that's kind of like an assistant bishop, and then um, full bishop in 396. He led a busy life, writing constantly. We have roughly two million words from him in treatises, commentaries, letters, hundreds of sermons. Many more sermons actually have been lost. He saw and oversaw many other bishoprics informally and formally. He was a kind of uberkopf uh, for much of the uh, Roman North African Christianity. As bishop, he was immediately a prominent citizen and public figure. His town's representative, kind of like a, uh, you know, sort of like a local dignitary. Everybody knew him, not just the Orthodox Christians, but also the Donatists. You remember um, that group of people whom we will discuss more in a moment, but those, that group of people that had separated themselves from the mainline church because of uh, 
uh, their refusal to reintegrate the lapsed from the pagan persecutions. And of course, there were still plenty of pagans around too, and many would come to him for advice, Christian and pagan alike, and quite often to settle disputes. And this all meant that he gained a first order acquaintance with small town and big town politics, and uh, together with all of its concomitant complexities of the region of North Africa as a whole, and over time even, the shape of the empire itself. As Bishop Augustine remained an orator, committed to transforming his audience's affections, now Many theologians of Augustine's era doubted the capacities of the simple folk to understand the abstruse metaphysical speculations of high-level theological inquiry. Augustine never did, though. He believed that the most ordinary, illiterate peasants could be great saints, just like Christ's disciples. So he thought theology was accessible to all, if only the theologian would take care to render his language in a way intelligible to ordinary folk. After all, as Augustine's teacher, St. Ambrose, had said, it was not by dialectic, that is, by strict logical hair-splitting, that it pleased God to save his people. For the kingdom of God consists in simplicity of faith, not in wordy contention. Great saints, thought St. Augustine, were the best and truest theologians. All who had faith would inevitably, he thought, seek understanding, and he took it to be his job, very definitely, to help them in that endeavor. Furthermore, Augustine insisted that the full vocation of the Christian life could be lived out in the ordinary life of the everyday common person. In one sermon, he said, Cyclum autem hoc erimus est, which means that this world itself is our desert, our place our, uh, of hermitage, our place of living out the fully religious life. And think about that in Latin, the word cyclum. Uh, the secular world can be our hermitage. Cyclum autum hoc erimus est. Just as Christ came into the world fully enfleshed, it is the fully fleshly world that will be redeemed. It is his understanding of the religious life in this way, manifest in his preaching and teaching about the universal corruption of humanity, and a sense that much of our ordinary life is deception, that has led many people to believe that Morally, he is fundamentally a juridical teacher, teaching us only to feel guilty, and that he taught that humans uh, have no freedom but are kind of puppets of God, so as to lock that guilt in place with despair. But again, as with the rumors about his Platonism, we'll see here too, the story about St. Augustine uh, is quite other than these rumors report. Finally, he was involved in several church controversies as bishop that were very important in his day and beyond. He managed the final resolution of the Donatist controversy, which had racked North Africa for over 100 years, and his writings sparked the Pelagian controversy, which began in the 400s, uh, and in some ways has never fully left the scene of Western Christianity um, uh, in the form of Protestantism. Uh, these two controversies both play roles in the city of God, and we should say something about them, uh, each one of them here. So just to remind you, the first of all, the Donatists. The North African Christian churches were split in Augustine's lifetime between those Christians who followed leaders who had not collaborated in the imperial persecutions of Christians a century earlier, and another group of Christians who remained in communion with leaders that, who, that had so collaborated. The churches broke communion. The churches who took a hardline stance on this were called the Donatists, and after, named after their leader Donatus, and the other ones were in, in communion with the mainline church, the Caecilianists. They were named after their bishop. The crucial thing that divided the two churches was whether there were absolute and final limits to toleration of morally corrupt people people who had demonstrated some moral corruption, or you know, a very high level, we might say, of moral corruption, denying Christ. The Donatists wanted to draw clear lines and hold them absolutely. Uh, they held that the sacraments administered by lapsed clergy were invalid, but uh, the mainline church, represented by Caecilius, Caecilius uh, did not accept this position. Um, as Augustine said, actually, uh, the clouds roll with thunder that the house of the Lord shall be built throughout the earth. 
and these frogs sit in their marsh and croak, we are the only Christians. So you see, this is kind of the Donatist position that the whole rest of these people are just kind of fallen Christians, but the Donatists are the only true church left. Um, by the time Augustine came to authority, the argument was a century old and both sides were deeply suspicious of one another. It is one of Augustine's signal accomplishments to finally convince the Roman authorities to break the will of the Donatist leaders. And of course, the church ultimately did come down in the decision of councils and condemn the Donatist position. I've explained this before. The Pelagian controversy was an enormously complicated debate uh, about the nature of free will in relationship to sin and grace. Could her human beings earn salvation? And if not, was it possible for humans after redemption to improve on their own? That is, was divine grace an external aid like a coach, or was it an internal energy and orientation like a good diet and plenty of vitamins? Uh, Pelagius was a British monk working as a spiritual guide to ascetic elites in Rome, monastics, and he thought Augustine's emphasis on the priority of grace deflated the urgency of individuals' moral striving, uh, that it effaced individual responsibility and degraded human dignity. In reply, Augustine thought Pelagius didn't understand the actual nature of God's saving work uh, or the direness of the human condition after the fall. Uh, the debate between them and then between some of Pelagius's disciples and Augustine continued for the rest of Augustine's life and indeed beyond. It has been perhaps one of the great theological battles in the Western, uh, in Western Christianity for the past 1600 years. Well, the end of the Donatist controversy and the beginning of the Pelagian controversy and the beginning of the writing of the City of God all happened at the same time. The Donatist controversy came to its climax and resolution in the Council of Carthage in 411, when the church very clearly codified its position that uh, the moral life of a priest has in no way any effect on the validity of the sacraments, and that all could be, upon repentance, reintegrated into the life of the community, of the faithful. Uh, and this was a council in which Augustine played perhaps the most prominent uh, role. And uh, once the, it was over, his decks had been cleared to begin writing the City of God in late 411 or 412. And he kept at it, although, although often distracted by other work, until he completed the whole thing 15 years later in either 426 or 427. The last few years of his life, he dies in 430, were just as busy as the earlier ones, and he kept on writing, teaching, and even occasionally preaching up to a few weeks before his death on August 28th, 4.30, when the Vandals, a group of Germanic barbarians, were besieging the city of Hippo. And it is here, in his dealings with the Donatists and the Pelagians, and his overall practice in the office of bishop, where his critics find warrant for their charge that he is a fundamentally anti-democratic thinker. In fact, they would even say he is an authoritarian who gave the highest moral and theological imprimatur for the practices of coercion popular in medi the medieval age. And we will see again these, um, as time goes on, these accusations of his metaphysical anti-worldliness and his moral psychological promotion of guilt uh, and uh, uh, guilt morality. We will see that this, together with those, his reputed political authoritarianism is really vastly overdrawn. In fact, in his role as a leader of the Latin Christian churches, Augustine was anything but authoritarian. As a bishop, he was more than just a religious leader. He was a political actor, and we've talked about this before, how the bishops had, after Constantine, kind of been invested with a lot of, a lot of power in the organization and running of their local communities. So um, uh, he, they, they could arbitrate on cases, and uh, you know, they, they certainly had the ability to weigh in on political issues through counseling of the of the, the magistrates and so on. Uh, so he was a political actor and judicial figure in some ways. And he became, as the historian Peter Brown has put it, a sort of one-man brain trust for the churches of Africa. Although his labors earned him great respect and veneration from others, he continued teaching what was effectively an anti-authoritarian vision of the gospel, one that was quite suspicious of figures, 
such uh, as he, he was accused of becoming. And he wasn't afraid of attacking himself in this way, actually. In one sermon, for instance, he said the following, do not even think of regarding as canonical scripture any debate or written account of the debate by anyone. If I have said something reasonable, then follow, but not me, but reason itself. If I have proved it by the clearest divine testimonies, then follow not me, but the divine scripture. I get angrier with that admirer of mine who takes my book as canonical than with the man who finds fault in my book with things that are in fact not wrong. Augustine knew the power and the danger of idolatry and celebrity, which of course are the same thing. And he knew the danger of both uh, was first to permit the idolater to offload the duty of thinking for oneself onto their idol. And secondly, he understood the problem there was to seduce the celebrity in turn into thinking that his fans have nothing insightful to say. That treatment of a fellow human, a fellow Christian, would not be the achievement of theology, but the avoidance of it. And he went out of his way in his life and in his words to try to forestall such approaches. It is therefore a tremendous irony, not to say tragedy, um, that in his afterlife, in his Nachleben, he has proven, uh, his writings have proven to be such monumental, powerful influences over so many, going uh, from his own day right on up to Calvin and, and others uh, in our own day and age, um, where he has been enlisted to support opinions that are really quite mistaken, uh, yet have become super influential, super popular. And to understand this requires us to realize just how powerful his impact on those who followed after him really was. In many ways, Augustine has been a victim of his own success, a victim of the final role he played, the role of legacy. <clears throat> and since Augustine overshadows almost literally all other historical figures of his era, we forget the human Augustine and envision only the saint. We imagine the singular father, as the phrase goes, the second founder of Christianity after St. Paul. No post-apostolic thinker uh, has been invoked more successfully or paradoxically more variously to authorize um, uh, the church's teachings in the West and for those who have um, gone, uh, taught things contrary to the church. Uh, subsequent Christians uh, learned many things by having them authorized by citations from Augustine's texts. Uh, but what, uh, but, and what they have learned and what Augustine meant to teach uh, are oftentimes, and have not oftentimes been the same thing whatsoever. In fact, oftentimes there have been very, very wrong. Uh, first of all, no other thinker is as rhetorically supple or as alert to his audience's expectations as was Augustine. He was Christian monastic, as I said, living church father, a savvy civic and ecclesiastical administrator, judge, advocate and jury, author, reader, preacher and teacher, philosopher, and one might even say anti-philosopher on occasion. Each role elicited a different voice in his writings, and his audiences were equally varied. Some were simple congregants, some were catechumens, uh, some were unlettered, some were educated laity with varying degrees of orthodoxy. Some were monks or nuns, anchorites, priests and bishops, heretics and schismatics, old noble Pagani, pagans, men and women within the church and outside of the church. And a second point to make is that, like John Henry Newman, a millennium later, Augustine realized that to live is to change, and he was never content with his last formulation on any particular issue. His thought reveals a continuous dynamism, flexibility of style, tone, and even argument that makes his position on many matters very hard to pin down. As we'll see, even when Augustine does offer a theological proposal, he typically hedges it about as one possible way of thinking, not ruling out others. But we, his ill-tutored pupils, fell so much in love with his formulations that we treated his books as statically canonical, the thing he, he said not to do. And those books have posthumously fossil fossilized into something equal or perhaps even exceeding divine writ, and exactly the same thing he feared would happen. Uh, 
he even tried to booby trap his own thought to stop this actually by writing a book very late in his life called the Retractationes, which sometimes is given in English as the retractations. The only problem with that is that that's not an English word. <laughs> so it really means something like revisions or rewritings. Uh, it is him going back. It doesn't mean retractions. That's a crucial point. He's not saying, he's not just talking about everything that he got wrong and wants to fix it. It's not quite that. It means looking over things a second time, looking over his books and, uh, and kind of giving some indication of nuance, how to teach people how to read them. And by the end of his life, um, uh, he was increasingly aware that the past would be communicated to the future, largely through his writings as through a bottleneck. And he knew enough that he had written so much that people would construct many conflicting opinion, opinions and positions from this great forest of his writing. Indeed, some of his own opponents were doing that already, quoting the young Augustine, of whom they approved, against the old Augustine, whom they condemned. And this is part of what I meant when I said earlier that he knew that, that we would be reading him. He feared people would find in his multitudinous books uh, whatever they wanted to find there. And he tried to stop that from happening. Um, in that regard, of course, he failed. Um, the history of thought in the West after Augustine uh, can be interpreted largely as a history of readings and uh, rereadings of Augustine uh, and indeed of misreadings of him. Consider, for instance, where he stands in the history of philosophy. He lived roughly 800 years after Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, and roughly 800 years before Thomas Aquinas. And there are roughly 800 years between Aquinas and today. So in a way, Augustine marks the transition between ancient and medieval philosophy. And that's oftentimes how you'll find him um, uh, categorized in history of, of Western philosophy. Um, Certainly most medieval philosophy is indeed some, in some capacity a commentary on Augustine. And a great deal of modern philosophy is a commentary on Augustine as well. Uh, more than most people, even some philosophers know, uh, don't, don't fully realize just how much that is the case. In terms of political thought, to read The City of God forces one to grapple with multiple interpretations of that book, rival readings really, whose alternatives and whose alternative structures, um, well, I'll put it this way, who the alternative rival readings structure much of the history of political thought in the West. Um, reading Augustine helps us better understand our past, how we got here today. This does not apply only to Christians or to those who are from Christian backgrounds. Uh, everyone in our world today may well be educated by his work, The City of God. Even non-Christians can find it useful to understand the most influential of Christian imaginations of the cosmos, of political order, and of the meaning of history. Furthermore, reading Augustine might now well help us to live in our, in, on into our future. For thinking about him helps us understand how and why we organize our secular world today. Consider that we stand at the end of Christendom. And this is something that I've talked about before in our time together. Uh, and this is an end in two senses. One, of course, is well known. The other, not so well known. The well known sense of the end of Christendom is clear. Christendom is over. If we understand that term to designate an effort to shape and sustain civilization on explicitly Christian terms, by and large, the world we live in now has largely left that ambition behind. And the status of religious beliefs, their legitimacy in public, the sincerity with which people try to organize their lives through them is much more contested and far more fragile and recognizably contingent than they have ever been before. And there are no signs that that trend is being reversed. The less well-known on, uh, sense, on the other hand, uh, is very different. And it is more surprising since it might seem the opposite of everything I've just said. For in another way, Christendom is over, fish, finished, in the sense that we have reached its end, since so much of what Christendom strive, st strove for has been accomplished. Um, slavery is now illegal. Equality is a watchword. We feel obligated to people far away 
whom we have no immediate contact with. And this moral revolution is one deeply oriented and driven by Christian history. So many contemporary so-called secular practices, categories, and judgments are in fact Christian practices, categories, and judgments, with the Christian language perhaps removed, but the deep Christian structure retained. Consider the universalism of our moral ideals, the concept of the individual, the tension between our public and our private lives. What does it mean to find ultimate value present in the imminent? What does it mean that the contingencies of our flesh could host the infinite value of the spirit? These are questions intelligible to us only since, for most of 2,000 years, Western intellectual thought was tempered or has been tempered under the pressure of Christian doctrines, such as the incarnation, God's universal sovereignty and care, and the idea that the human was made in the image of God. In so very many ways, then, we live in a world deeply Christian in shape and detail, even as it has lost the surface appearance of being Christian. Even the most secular among us would be unintelligible to a pagan of Augustine's day, while a member of his church would find much common ground with a modern atheist, let's say. Even in our very worldliness, then, we are worldly in a Christian way today. And I don't say this out of any kind of smug triumphalism. In fact, the greatest explorers of this truth have been non-Christian thinkers like Friedrich Nietzsche and Max Weber. Um, and therefore, for Christians, and, uh, as well as for non-Christians, Augustine's work has clues about how to be authentically Christian in an age where Christian categories have become second nature and can be absorbed secondhand. And his vision of what is asked by faith still retains some of North Africa's hardiness, some of its vehemence as well, as we'll see. And for those that are not Christian, Augustine's was the last generation before the 20th century to genuinely grapple with a truly religiously pluralistic society. And in living in that condition, he has lessons for us all. And that is a really, really important point to make, that religious pluralism in the West will basically come to an end uh, in his time, um, definitely by the time of Justinian. But it, it, will, it is certainly what we live in and take for granted in our day and age. So in many ways, his writings, writing for such a diverse audience of pagans and Christians alike, various different types of Christians, um, uh, he has lessons for us all. Now, what I would like to do is to now share with you a brief movie about the sack of Rome uh, that will help then segue into our uh, discussion for the rest of today. The Roman Empire has grown so large that it must divide. To... Diocletian officially divides the empire into two halves, east and west. It's easier to govern, it's easier to defend from external forces. two sides work together to protect the eastern border from the unconquered frontier beyond, where the line separating Roman from barbarian begins to blur. Romans were becoming less and less confident in their own military abilities and more and more reliant on those of the barbarians. By 394 AD, most of the soldiers serving in the Roman armies are barbarian mercenaries. Among them are the Goths, who've lived as a separate nation within the empire for more than a decade. Some of the children of Adrianople became good Romans. They became Roman officers. Uh, one of those was Alaric. Alaric, now 24 years old, is a general commanding a division of 20,000 Goths who fight on behalf of Rome. Alaric's prepared to fight because he's been promised land. This is his great opportunity now to end the refugee status of his people and to be able to settle within the Roman Empire. Alaric serves under General Stilicho, commander of the Eastern Army, a Roman soldier with a barbarian bloodline. 
He's a person who has a vandal father and a Roman mother who's grown up inside of Roman military circles but is still treated like something of an outsider. Barbarians now live, fight, and die under Rome's banner. But they are not Roman, and the Empire sees them as expendable. When war breaks out, Alaric and his men become pawns in a deadly game. We are to attack just before first light. And? You and your men will lead the first assault across the river. Where? Here. That's their stronghold. You're proposing an assault on their most fortified position. That's where I least expected. So would we fodder for their archers? Half my men will die before we reach the banks. You have your orders. Friend. Persuade the Emperor this is a bad idea. It's the Emperor's idea. And he has absolute faith in you to implement it. He's condemning us to death. Gothic soldiers bore the brunt of the casualties fighting on the eastern side against Western Roman soldiers. Rome abused the Goths in combat situations. They put them on the front line, used them as sort of cannon fodder. Thousands are lost, and his troops were committed before any Romans were thrown into the fray. lost 10,000 of my men today. Slaughtered, as we knew they would be, and they were sacrificed for him. Alaric, think. Take a drink, and be glad to be alive. The Emperor is in a mood for celebrating, not dissent. You celebrate the victory. I'll mourn my loss. Don't do anything rash, my friend. You're angry now, but things are changing. The world we live in now is very different from the world we were born into. Yes, it is. Then we fought against these bastards and were proud to. Now we do their dirty work and lick their boots. Stay calm, be patient. Who knows what changes may come? Change, yes. You know I've learned, my friend? Change only comes through the power of the sword. They sacrifice us in their wars. They work us to death on their roads and in their cities. They take our daughters and invade our bloodline. In 30 years, the gods will be extinguished. I think the betrayal that Alaric felt after the Frigidus was such that he really despaired of any accommodation with the Empire after that. Everything becomes very clear for Alaric at this point. He realizes that he's never going to be able to end this refugee status within the Empire. If he can't work with the Empire, he's going to have to go back to type and work against it. An estimated 100,000 Goths live inside the Empire. Alaric intends to unite them all under one leader. 
always existed outside the Roman Empire. Alaric was effectively saying that he was not going to be a subject of the Roman Empire anymore. Today you crowned me king. An honor. What is a king without a kingdom? What is a crown on a king without a kingdom? Without a homeland, we are forsaken. For years, we've swallowed Rome's lies and cruelties and grasped at the crumbs from their table. Today, you crowned me king. Will I demand a kingdom? We will take this land, either as conquerors or as dead men. But from today, we cease to do Rome's bidding. From today, we go to war with Rome. Rome dominates the ancient world for 600 years. But no empire lasts forever. By 400 AD, it struggles to hold on to its power against the rising barbarian threat. Alaric's Goths push deeper into Roman territory, carving out a home from the lands they conquer. A campaign of destruction that goes on for eight years. If Rome is to survive, General Stilicho, now the supreme commander of Rome's western armies, must end the war. We've journeyed far, the both of us. Perhaps. Doesn't all this killing tire you? Ah, oh, I've seen what Rome calls peace. There is no need for us to be at war. You have power. We have none. You have a homeland. We have none. There'll be no peace until my people have a land to call their own. I can give you that. <laughs> but the Huns to the east, they respect no border. I need you and the Visigoth people to work with me. Why would we? because I can give you what you want. Help me fight our enemies, and I promise you, you'll have your land. You have my word. The word of a Roman doesn't count for much, I've learned. The word of a friend, then. Then know this. Should I accept, and you betray me, no woman, child, or man in Rome will escape my vengeance. I would expect nothing less. Alaric has seen Rome betray his people time and again since they arrived 29 years ago, seeking refuge from the Huns. But he seizes the opportunity. Stilicho's deal promises the Gauls the prize they've long been fighting for. A permanent homeland. In exchange, Alaric and his men agree to help defend the Empire against the Huns. The Gauls spend the next five years fighting to protect the eastern frontier holding up their end of the bargain. But Stilicho never delivers on his promise. The Roman Empire is watching as the central part of its territory is being taken over and held by non-Roman peoples. A rising tide of anti-barbarianism is growing and leads to suspicion of Stilicho. Even though he's always served Rome well, and even though he's led their armies effectively, 
He's seen as a potential enemy within. The immediate consequence for Alaric of the assassination of Stilicho is that the deal is dead in the water. It's precisely the arrogance of the oppressor of Rome that precedes the fall. How is it possible these Romans so completely duplicitous and unworthy have ruled the world for centuries. Will they rule no longer? It was a colossally stupid move to have Stilicho executed. It eventually led to the defection of huge numbers of barbarian troops over to Alaric's side. Alaric has been betrayed and disappointed time and time and time again. He wanted his homeland. The Romans constantly took it away from him. So what he decides to do is that he'll take away the homeland from the Romans. He's going to go and sack Rome. Rome is the center of the empire. Five sprawling square miles surrounded by walls 40 feet high a model of the Empire's vision for how to build the world in its image. Thousands of Goths and thousands more of Stilicho's men who now pledge loyalty to Alaric march on Rome. Alaric has the city in his sights. been the ancient world's supreme power for 600 years. In that time, no barbarian leader has ever marched on the city itself. It seemed impregnable, but of course its Achilles heel was that it needed massive amounts of food in order to supply the nearly one million people who lived there. Alaric understood that, and when he undertook the siege, that was the weapon he would use. The barbarians surround the city, cutting off supply lines, trying to starve Rome into surrender. Alaric besieges Rome three times in 18 months. The Goths manage to effectively blockade the city, even from access to the sea, which they usually rely on for their food supplies. So starvation reaches a very serious pitch in Rome. But the war of attrition takes its toll on Roman and Goth alike. You get dire consequences on both sides. At Rome, there's plague and famine. Uh, there are calls to legalize cannibalism. On the Gothic side, there's plague in their army. So they really need to come to a resolution. of peace to the Roman Senate. What word from your senators? There are to be no terms. The senators believe your offer was made from weakness. We'll fight you here. And if we leave now, do they give their word you won't come after us? <laughs> 
from the Roman point of view, this looks really good. It looks like victory. It looks like they've withstood the siege and Alaric's going to slope off. They might even be able to pick him off at a later stage. But they've seriously underestimated Alaric and his brilliance. Onward. Send them a message. If they grant us this last night to prepare our dead for burial, I'll make a gift to the senators of Rome. A gift, my lord? 300 of our best men as slaves. The Senate agrees to the deal. But Alaric does not intend to retreat. Arrogance is a two-way sword. On one hand, you've got to have the unshakable belief that you're the greatest thing ever in the world and no one can take you down. On the flip side, it can lead to failure. You've got to be really brutally honest with yourself. Great empires have been lost because they refuse to see their weakness. The brilliant and really rather ironic thing is that the Romans trace their ancestry back to the Trojans. And what Alaric has given them is effectively a Trojan horse. These slaves are not any old slaves. They're actually 300 of his finest warriors. today don't address me goth scum move on no I'm asking do you know who we're burying today your idiot brother maybe your whore of a sister no we're burying Rome This. Ah! It's for my sister. Romans. We're not Huns. We have our victory. Let some live so they can tell of it. Tell your children your days of power are over. Psychologically, this was a massive blow. This was the capital of this world empire being brought to its knees. Empires rise and fall. What makes them great may not be lasting. The sack of Rome is Alaric's greatest victory. 
A strike so devastating that the Empire never recovers. The tide has really turned now. Essentially, once upon a time, the barbarians were at the mercy of Rome, but now Rome is at the mercy of the barbarians. In the aftermath of its defeat, the Empire cedes 30,000 square miles of territory in southern Gaul to the Goths. Alaric delivers the homeland he promised his people, but he never sees it. He dies of fever just one month after the attack on Rome. Imagine, if you will, that you live in an empire that has lasted 1,000 years. In all that time, almost all other civilizations have been incorporated into this empire. Its people are prosperous, its cities magnificent, its land secure. You know of no people, no kingdom that equals in its greatness. Indeed, there is little beyond its boundaries with which to compare it. It seems that human society and the empire are bound up in one another. Now imagine that in your lifetime, the empire is invaded from the outside by barbarians. And not just outsiders, not just enemies or bad people, but barbarians. People who not only have bad teeth and poor hygiene, but people who in some sense are uncivilized, not quite lawless, but rather operating on a very primitive set of laws that could never suffice to govern a society as sophisticated as your own. Imagine that these barbarians swarm like ants over your borders, ravage your countryside, besiege and sack your towns and cities, and imagine that these barbarians finally reach the original capital of your empire, the greatest city ever known, the center of the world, and overrun it run howling down its streets, kick down the doors of its official buildings of state and religion, run rampant in muddy boots over the plush purple carpets of the offices and palaces of the rulers, raping and killing and plundering as they go. Imagine that is that the barbarians win, that civilization as you know it comes to an end. Imagine that you inhabit a world that is by and large over. You have no idea where your food will come from next year, or if it will come at all. Who will guard the streets, or whether the streets even need guarded anymore, now that the barbarians can go into any house with impunity and kill or enslave all the occupants. And what happens when the barbarians leave to go home, after killing all the officials and destroying all the buildings? Can you imagine building all over again? But what would it be like if they stay? What would, it, what would that be like? Such was the situation facing the Roman world when Augustine began to write his City of God. Augustine writes in the wake of chaos, attempting to accept it, not accept it as a defeat, but accept it as what has happened, an attempt to learn from it, to see what it can teach us, what use we can make of its sufferings, um, and to what end we might direct the essentially unjust acts that we must enact upon others in its wake. Now, the Visigoths who attacked the city were not giant, ignorant cavemen wearing animal skins and wielding unsheathed swords and massive axes who poured over the frontiers in a foaming rage and made straight for Rome. Rather, as we saw in the movie, they had enter, en entered the empire with their families as refugees fleeing the Huns another barbarian tribe, 30-odd years before in 376. And by the 400s, they were themselves Aryan Christians and well-informed about civilization and its many, many attractions. Furthermore, their route to the sack can only be described as winding. The initial welcome the authorities offered them in 376 rapidly wore out. There was famine, and the Romans decided to end their threat. Um, a climactic battle against them had been fought in 378, you remember, in Adrianople, that is in modern-day Bulgaria. Um, 
And uh, I'm sorry, no, that is actually modern day European Turkey, as a matter of fact, uh, as you can see in the map. It was calamitous and the Roman defeat was total. The emperor Valens uh, died either in the battle or soon afterwards. And after this, the new emperor Theodosius signed a treaty with the Visigoths, letting them settle in Thrace and turning them from enemies with, within the borders to a rich source of mercenary military power for the empire. Uh, that great battle that Alaric was so piqued at was the Battle of the Frigidus River that we learned about last time. Remember when the senators in the West basically kind of sponsored a one last sort of pagan hurrah, uh, a usurper that they backed named Eugenius, and uh, Theodosius put down that rather pathetic rebellion in, um, uh, in the mid-390s, 394 to be precise. After Theodosius' death, though, in 395, the younger, um, I was really youngish, really, Alaric became headman of the Visigoths, and they once again became personae non gratae, a sort of nomadic people harassed by the locals and harried by imperial troops wherever they went, fleeing into northern Italy, strengthened by soldiers defecting from the legions, now substantially populated by captured barbarians themselves, hence unreliably Roman. Eventually, the Visigoths washed up in late 408 under the walls of Rome. The movie didn't really go into all this, but there's actually a lot of back and forth that took place over the next two years. 20 months, actually, of negotiations and Machiavellian real politic followed, full of mischances, foiled plans, folly, and sheer stupid accident. At one point, Alaric himself proposed to the Romans, uh, whom he was besieging, that he send some of his own troops to Africa to gather food for them to survive the siege. In other words, he really didn't want to do this in some ways. He really just wanted some territory and some sort of equal respect within the empire. At another point, Alaric's forces, on the way to negotiate with the emperor at Ravenna, fought a Romano-Gothic a military unit led by another and possibly rival Visigoth barbarian named Saurus. So there was a lot of infighting here, a lot of um, a lot of real mischances, and in the end, through the mysteries of accident and obscure motives, surprisingly inflected uh, by unforeseen forces and a thousand other micro causes, Rome's most almost millennium long luck ran out, and late one night. Slaves, uh, you know, that 300 group uh, that, that we saw in the movie that had been enslaved, unlocked the Salarian Gate. And as Edward Gibbon put it two centuries or more ago, on August 24th, 410, 1163 years after the foundation of Rome, the imperial city, which had subdued and civilized so considerable a part of, the, of mankind, was delivered to the licentious fury of the tribes of Germany and Scythia. The Visigoths sacked the city for three days. The damage was great to shrines and public places and those great city homes of the wealthy. But as far as we can tell, the city as a whole actually got off otherwise lightly as far as sacks go. The Visigoths hit only the high wealth buildings, skimming off the cream while leaving the majority so long as they stayed out of the way, largely unmolested. Although one can suspect, certainly, that rape and assault was, if not universal, at least common. Although, uh, and as we'll see, actually, Augustine will actually deal with this, uh, this problem of rape uh, in, his, in his opening book of the City of God. The populace was not rounded up for slaves, although some were taken as hostage, including the emperor's sister, who later became wife of Ataulf, leader of the Visigoths after Alaric. Recall that the Western emperor at this point, Honorius, was in Ravenna. Um, the infrastructure of the city was not harmed. The city itself did not burn. After all, the Visigoths were not utter barbarians. And as Arian Christians, that is, um, you know, that heretical kind of Christian, uh, they still treated the... Um, the Christian churches, which had in recent decades become sites of remarkable wealth, as no go zone, sanctuaries for any and all who fled to them. And many pagan and Christian uh, people in the city, especially the wealthy, did flee to them and when were left unmolested. <laughs> 
The sack ended, though, on Alaric's command, and the Visigoths marched south, looting along their line of march, hoping to winter in Africa. But the ships for the journey failed to materialize, having been largely sunk in a storm. And then Alaric died. Atta Ulf took over, as I said, and the Goths, after spending the winter in Calabria, marched north again through Italy, over the Alps, and into Gaul, finally setting in Aquitaine, which you see in front of you, uh, that is in the western part of Gaul. Most of the population of Rome picked themselves up, dusted themselves off afterwards, and continued on with their lives. The sack was, as it were, merely a flesh wound. The people for whom the sack was most disastrous, however, and the people who had the largest voice in recording the details of its sack for posterity were the upper-class survivors and victims, those who had lost the most in the sack itself. Many thousands of these people left Rome behind and went to Africa, northern Africa. It might be that they had land holdings there. Many wealthy farms in North Africa were held by absentee landlords. And so with the loss of their opulent Roman palaces, they decided to move to a land far from the barbarians, and closer to the sources of much of their wealth. But for the most part, even in Rome itself, the sack had little direct effect on their lives. But many across the Mediterranean world were shocked by the sack, both psychologically and ideologically. In far off Palestine, St. Jerome uh, wrote the following words, in a letter describing his grief at hearing the, the, about the fall of Rome. <clears throat> a dreadful rumor came from the West. Rome had been besieged and its citizens had been forced to buy their lives with gold. Then thus despoiled, they had been besieged again so as to lose not their substance only, but their lives. My voice sticks in my throat and as I dictate, sobs choke my utterance. The city which had taken the whole world was itself taken. Nay, more famine was before with the sword, but few citizens were left to be made captives. In their frenzy, the starving people had recourse to hideous food and tore each other limb from limb that they might have flesh to eat. Even the mother did not spare the babe at her breast. In the night was Moab taken. In the night did her wall fall down. A quote from Isaiah. O God, the heathen have come into your inheritance. Your holy temple have they defiled. They have made Jerusalem an orchard. The dead bodies of your servants have they given to be meat unto the fowls of the heaven. The flesh of your saints unto the beasts of the earth. Their blood have they shed like water round about Jerusalem, and there was none to bury them. For days and nights I could think of nothing but the universal safety. When my friends were captured, I could only imagine myself a captive too. When the brightest light of the world was extinguished and the very head of the Roman Empire was severed, the entire world perished in a single city. Now, some of this, of course, is Jerome's fantastic rhetoric, but there's no doubt that the entire Roman world suffered a severe psychological shock with the fall of Roman 410. The belief that the Roman Empire had entered a glorious new era with the imperial conversion to Christianity of Constantine in the fourth century, the dramatic conversion of Constantine, and then the treachery of Julian the Apostate, <clears throat> who had turned against Christianity and tried to restore the old gods, but then was killed uh, very quickly, right after less than two years of reign. And then the recovery of Christian Rome under uh, emperors uh, Jovinian, Valentinian, and Valens, and then ultimately Gratian. This all had secured for many people two narratives. One, for Christians, was the story of the triumph of Christianity in Rome, classically told, of course, by Eusebius that we've been talking about this entire course in his great ecclesiastical history. The other narrative for the pagans was the aging and decline of Rome and of Roman power, murdered at the hands of the Christian. But as much as the latter narrative did not approve of the course the empire was taking, it could not really imagine the empire would ever end, or that its sacred precincts would be violated. As ever, Im imagination is far more constricted than the concrete accidents of reality itself. <clears throat> Why did the sack have this effect? To understand, you have to know at least a little about how the Romans saw the world, and in particular, how they saw the spaces outside their imperium, as well as how they saw their imperium itself. 
people in what we consider, uh, we condescend to call late antiquity, did not understand that they were living in late antiquity. They believed, as had the Christian thinker Eusebius, almost a century before the sack, that after the third century turbulence and crisis of the empire, the bloody civil wars, and uh, then the conversion of Constantine, there was now a newfound peace and stability within the borders, and a just and omnipotent God now oversaw the Imperium's security. Certainly there was no thought that barbarians would ever invade the empire, or that they would even want to. They were apparently content out there in their misty forests, huddled around their damp and smoky fires, and out there was about as definite as they could be placed. On our historical maps, the Roman Empire always has edges, but that's not how the Romans themselves saw it. The nature of imperium itself was not quite what we mean by empire. It really means more akin to rule, uh, without definite geographical boundaries. The imperium romanum was where the Romans were obeyed. The, the word itself comes from the Latin word imperare, meaning to command, and it meant the area over which the Romans could tell people what to do. They were there were many different ways to issue commands, of course, and many different ways to obey them, too. But the key everywhere was obedience, not necessarily direct and continuous control, but auctoritas, the ability to, to exert one's will. The Roman idea of boundaries, what in, Greek, in Latin is called, are called limites or limits, uh, at this time were understood to signify how far Rome had deigned to go. It, did not, it was not a set of borders, in our sense, of, of walls or something like that, that Rome was safe within. The Imperium, with the awkward exception of the complicated and often ignored Persian Empire to the east, was not surrounded by rival states, but by wilderness. It did not have borders, it had frontiers. There was an important sense of, that no boundary existed for the Empire, for the Imperium. There was only the edge of where Rome had deigned to reach. As Virgil, the greatest poet of the Latin language, put it, the Romans possessed an imperium sine fine, an empire without end, and its endlessness was not simply spatial but also temporal. In 410 AD, the Romans understood themselves to be in roughly 1,163 years since the founding of the city. By Augustine's age, that is, they were the inheritors of a genuinely 1,000-year Reich. What was more, as we've seen, this Reich admitted no rivals. They moved easily from talking about imperium as under our command to under our law, and then to under law itself. That is to say, an aspect of what it meant to be a barbarian increasingly over the centuries was to live outside the law, to live in a lawless essentially inhumane way. The Romans imagined all those who were outside to be pathetic creatures living without any law in a state of nature. And to the Roman, imperium came to be imagined not as a discrete state, but as coterminous co with civilization and the rule of law itself. What was more, this was to the Romans a humanitarian empire. The Romans had a habit of identifying their own empire with the scope of humanitas, a word that is usefully ambiguous between humane and human. It was, for instance, Roman humanitas that had suppressed uh, the Druids uh, who practiced human sacrifice. Of course, all empires are humanitarian to those who enjoy their benefits, just as all wars are waged for selfless humanitarian purposes by the victors. But the Romans didn't think this. They saw their imperium as unique, as especially dedicated to helping the rest of the world. Moreover, the Imperium was a deeply cosmopolitan place, enabling travel and encouraging trade across thousands of miles and between wildly different peoples. In an age of very limited travel, when most people lived their entire lives within 15 miles of the place where they were born and never knew anyone who was not basically the same as them, the Imperium was a community of unprecedentedly diverse ways of being human, far more than the Greeks who had never stopped thinking of every non-Greek speaker as basically barbarous. For the Romans, however, there were many gentes, peoples or nations. 
within the empire. And they could remain who they were so long as they obeyed some basic parameters, laws, and did not, you know, didn't do certain minimal kinds of, of bad things. Um, and of course, perform certain kinds of service to the empire as they could. Their humanitarian and cosmopolitan self-understanding was manifest in how they governed these conquered peoples. To put it briefly, with an almost schizophrenic combination of liberality and brutality, the Romans were quite religiously and culturally tolerant, as we've seen, but they were politically fascist. Once conquered, a people could do almost anything they wanted to, as long as they did a prescribed number of small things in the Roman way. And therefore, my use of the phrase Thousand Year Reich was not casual. Ancient Roman rule was very palpably a combination of the most vaporous personal laissez-faire and the tightest political control. And it was almost always justified by the fact that they had civilization and the others did not. They saw the barbarians the way we might see Neanderthals, sharing a great deal with us, of course, but fundamentally other, uh, another kind of creature altogether, unless we choose, of course, to educate them and thereby raise them up to our rational heights. But then the barbarians turned out to be other than what the Romans had complacently expected them to be. And so once the barbarians started moving and during, uh, during the late 4th century, moving into the empire, the ignorant contempt that the Romans typically felt for all those outside their imperium changed. Um, it, cha it changed its coloring from mild amusement, such as one would feel toward a caged animal in the zoo, to increasingly paranoid alarm. Uh, such as one would feel when the animals have escaped their cages and are now prowling outside of your front door. Now the roles, you see, had been reversed, and this is, uh, it is we, the Romans, who are enclosed. That would be the, the analogy. Consider, for instance, how an anonymous Roman writing an anonymous military text from the 360s or the 370s described the barbarians. He says, Wild nations are pressing down the Imperium Romanum and howling about it everywhere, and treacherous barbarians, protected by natural defenses, menace every frontier. This evocative image, an image of people standing around a campfire at night like wolves howling, or with the wolves howling, howling with the wolves, prowling around just outside the sphere of dim flickering light, this captures well the psychology of Rome when it was on its heels, but it derives from the aggressively ignorant bemusement that the Romans felt in an earlier, more confident time. It wasn't just the fact that Rome had been sacked, which challenged their ideas about who the barbarians were and who they themselves were. It was also the fact that they were ch their notions were now challenged of just what a crisis itself was. And this was a new kind of crisis altogether. Rome, of course, had had a history of crises, rivals from within, enemies from without. Rome knew what a crisis felt like. The third century, you remember, had been an era of civil war, uh, sometimes coming close to horrible anarchy as rival emperors struggled for control before being resolved finally uh, by Constantine at the beginning of the fourth century, when the imperium had seemed to recover. But this now in 410 felt different. This felt like something new. There had been, there had not been a radical challenge from outside since Hannibal and the Carthaginians 600 years or more before. And that had been in an age of Roman virtue and nostalgia, uh, you know, which nostalgia placed in the far off past. Uh, and um, a clear eyed vision of the present showed was definitely not alive now. Then again, the other problem was of their own making. Their history of success had er erased in their imagination the idea of failure. Quite literally, they had no historical analogy for what was coming. Historically, one civilization had replaced another on top, but there was no memory of any collapse of civilization itself. Now there had been civilizational collapses in the deep past. One th thinks of the Bronze Age, uh, for instance, which perhaps only the Egyptians remembered in their annals and hieroglyphics carved onto ancient temple walls, but not in any kind of religious or political or institutional memory was there anything that the Romans had access to about this. Change wasn't supposed to be that dramatic. 
thinkers had developed the idea of cyclical visions of civilizational hegemony. Plato, for instance, and Polybius um, uh, had talked about these things. No one imagined apocalypse. Uh, there was no real idea of a dark age. Even Aeneas in myth escaped complete disaster. He carried out his own father on his back from the burning rubble of Troy to found Rome. No one thought in terms of the end of the world, the end of their world. Another point is that the Romans already felt their world was changing in two ways. First of all, the Romans of Augustine's day felt a deep sense of lost moral integrity. Everywhere they looked, the past stood in mute, elo mutely eloquent rebuke to the present. The memory of greatness with the moral murkiness um, sanded away provoked a poignant despair to Romans viewing their present situation. They were haunted by the memory of Republican glory, memory of Caesar or of Cato, Scipio Africanus, and the many memorial statues and monuments scattered across the empire cities, many of which still survive today, um, made such heroism's absence more palpable and painful and their consciences at their own moral decline all the more guilty. Perhaps it was inevitable then that as a nation aged and its own history grew richer and deeper, certain episodes or eras or people would stand out as remarkable heroes worthy of emulation. After all, nations always seek heroes and it's safer to plant them in the sepia-toned precincts of the distant past. Perhaps for the Romans, the marble precincts where vital conflicts and clashing values are washed away and the simple, straightforward moral example is privileged. Additionally, though, the rise of Christianity was a genuinely new thing. The emergence of an empire-wide religion that sought to convert all people of all different nationalities, the gentes, and what was more terrifying of all social classes to a more, more new moral and spiritual posture, one that was possibly fundamentally alien to traditional Roman mores and pietas. This was a new kind of internal threat. The Romans had, had uh, could accommodate the idea of different peoples, as we've said, with their different rituals and beliefs, and they were eager to incorporate new kinds of human cultures within their empire. Diversity, of course, is our greatest strength, as we never stop hearing. But they required all of them to fit inside the Roman categories, not to challenge the terms on which Rome understood the world. And the Christians simply wouldn't do that. First of all, they were like and oddly unlike the Jews that the Romans had already encountered. The Christians, yes, were radical monotheists too, but they seemed to think that their God should be the God for everybody now and not at some distant point in the hazy future. So their evangelism uh, mixed groups of people, uh, classes of people in ways that the Romans found deeply disturbing. Also, the Christians were pretty clear that their loyalty to the Imperium was less important than their loyalty to uh, their Christ, and that Christ had shown them what they should do when the two loyalties conflicted. Furthermore, the Christians became, in, in, the, in their first century or two, a pretty apocalyptic group with expectations of the radical transformation of the world uh, that we all share. Nonetheless, Nothing is, is, le is less welcome to a hegemonic political power than an ideology that says the moral shape of the cosmos is designed to undo their empire. And the ideology becomes more unwelcome still when events in the outside world conspire to suggest that there might be something to that ideology's message of the transience of worldly power and glory. Seek transit gloria mundi. And so it was not precisely the sack of Rome in 410 that provoked Augustine to compose his book, but the general shock that it gave the elite, Christian and pagan alike. And that shock was itself merely a catalyzing force that crystallized a whole constellation of their concerns. For some of them, their concerns were framed in a pagan idiom, for others in a Christian one. But whatever the language, they were already anxious. 
And yet always for these reasons, they were pretty well unprepared for it. When the shock came, it synthesized a number of different forces and arguments running over the surface of the late imperial world. And that's why this studying of this text is really so perfect for our entire course on pagans and Christians. In its briefest surmise, the question really boiled down to an alteration of one of Tertullian's famous dictums. What has Rome to do with Jerusalem? You see, uh, Augustine shaped his book, The City of God, to answer that question. What has Rome to do with Jerusalem? As a teacher of rhetoric, he knew that you must always keep your audience in mind. Writing was always dialogical for him, a matter of conversation between a particular speaker and particular hearers. And thus it behooves us to understand who made up the audience for the city of God. For in no other work of his was his audience as richly diverse as it was here. Right now, this is if you're following along in the notes, this is now the third section. Uh, I want to explore how his audiences invisibly shaped his book and how their silent, looming presences in his mind and in his world help us to understand aspects of the book that we would otherwise not notice. Consider at first that the book in its first sentence is written in answer to a request from one Marcellinus. Who is he? Flavius uh, Marcellinus was a Christian and a tribune and notary under the Western emperor Honorius. He was the emperor's personal envoy and direct agent sent to Africa to oversee the great council of Carthage in 411, which adjudicated the Donatist uh, Catholic debates in North Africa. He was a major Roman player and a friend of Augustine. Augustine dedicated the entire city of God to Marcellinus. He looked to be the kind of Christian political actor that Augustine had in mind. But in 413 AD, after Augustine had finished and published books one through three of the City of God, Marcellinus was caught up in a great tumult. Roman North Africa was thrown into chaos by what became known as the Revolt of Heraclion, uh, a certain kind of count of Africa, provincial magistrate, who tried to invade Italy and seize control of the Western Empire. In its aftermath, Mar Marcellinus was arrested accused of being one of Heraclian's allies. And despite the pleas of many, not least of which was uh, St. Augustine, he together with his brother Apringius were executed in public in disgrace through decapitation by the sword on September 13th, 413. Within a year of his death, however, it became clear that he had been innocent and that the authorities had acted in anxious haste, killing a good man and a loyal servant of the empire. Augustine never swerved from his loyalty to his friend. Many years later, when the Imperium uh, Marcellinus had served seemed shattered beyond repair, Augustine recalled Marcellinus's prompt for the book. And in the very last paragraph of Book 22, the last book of the City of God, 15 years on after Marcellinus' death, Augustine describes the completion of the work as a recompense for a debt he had accepted long ago. We can trace the origins of that debt pretty clearly. In fact, in the winter of 411 and 412, after the Council of Carthage was over, Marcellinus wrote to Augustine and reported his difficulties in responding to those Roman refugees still devoted to the old gods. These pagans had angrily blamed the sack and all the Imperium's ills on the Christians. Marcellinus reported some questions put to him by one Volusianus, a Roman nobleman, who was raised pagan, but was considering conversion, uh, but was now wavering in his consideration because of the, this objection. That is, many of the pagans said it was because people switched over from the old gods to Christianity that Rome fell. According to Marcellinus, Volusianus also worried about Christianity's negative civic consequences. As Volusianus read the Gospels, Christ's teachings were incompatible, he said, with the morals of citizenship of those concerned with public affairs. After all, Marcellinus says, Christ taught us not to return evil for evil, to turn the other cheek, to give our cloak when one asks for a tunic, or to go twice the distance with one who asks us. These commands, says Volusianus, are contrary to the morals of citizenship. How might one respond to this, 
Marcellinus asks Augustine. Well, Augustine wrote back, and in his letter, Augustine said that he had heard these arguments as well, put to him from those who charge our faith with hostility to the commonwealth, he said. Augustine suggested that the crucial point to press in response is that a city is but a group of men united by a specific bond of peace, and such a peace was best secured by those with the proper disposition. He allowed that much of the Christian morality was not immediately applicable to public affairs, but then he went on, arguing that Christianity, in fact, was a better basis for the civic virtues that sustained a city than was paganism. And this is a direct quote from uh, Augustine's letter to Marcellinus. It is in this cesspool of evil characters where the ancient ethos has been abandoned that the presence uh, and assistance of heavenly authority is most needed. This exhorts us to voluntary poverty, to restraint, to benevolence, justice and peace, true piety, and other splendid and powerful virtues. It doesn't do this only for the sake of living this life honorably, or only to provide a peaceful community for the earthly city. It does so also to win everlasting security for the heavenly and divine commonwealth of a people that will live forever. Faith, hope, and charity make us adopted citizens of the city, so that as long as we are on our pilgrimage, we are, if we are unable to reform them, we should at least tolerate those who want the commonwealth to remain with its vices unpunished. Ultimately, then, Augustine argued that the theological virtues of faith, hope, and love do not disable civic virtue, but in fact are properly enablers of it. So Christians are not just acceptable citizens, they are the best citizens. And this passage succinctly expresses how Augustine imagined morality to relate to politics, an idea developed much more fully in the city of God. What is more, this letter reveals a deep strategy of the whole work. Christianity rightly understands the true goods that the pagan Romans and all other interlocutors blindly seek. Hence, Christians are best able rightly to inhabit this world and be exemplary citizens because they know how to value it properly. So Christianity does not ruin the Romans' hopes, but transfigures and fulfills them, though the Romans may not recognize this. And we will see this argumentative strategy deployed again and again by Augustine throughout the city of God. Uh, this is really a fantastic, remarkable moment in Augustine's letters. Here in this exchange between him and Marcellinus, you hear as if through the door into another room, a snatch of real conversation between flesh and blood humans 1600 years ago. This exchange with Marcellinus and through him Volusianus is but one example of the diverse kinds of audience that Augustine had in mind in writing the City of God. And I should just say something about them here. Augustine was always lucky in his enemies the various challenges they brought him, all of which forced him to articulate carefully his own theological views. And what is more, he internalized these opponents, that is, he imaginatively entered into their worldviews, apprehending both their insights and what made them worry about his positions. As the historian Peter Brown put it, Augustine absorbed, digested, and transformed his opponents' his positions. People rarely accuse Augustine of misunderstanding the views he opposes misrepresenting them, perhaps, but not misunderstanding. Um, for example, unlike contemporaries like his colleague St. Jerome, Augustine's relationship to the pagan world is calmer, more stable, less prone to uh, anathemas or unctuous neediness. Perhaps because of his own pagan upbringing, education, and early adulthood, by the time he came to write The City of God, Augustine knew the pagan world very well and from the inside. Consider the range of positions that Augustine confronted with every sentence that he wrote in The City of God. First, there were the civically-minded Roman patriots. They assumed that whatever happiness we are to have, we are to have it in this life and no other. And they believed in the basic decency of Roman tradition, including the various political and religious ritual practices, such as sacrifices to the gods, the cultural forms, such as the stage and drama, ritual, all of which Augustine thought morally and spiritually abhorrent. Augustine's debate with these voices dominates and orders his first five books. Second, there were philosophically minded elite Roman uh, inquirers, 
we can call them, from Neoplatonic philosophers to Manichaean believers, people who sought wisdom and happiness, not through worldly success, but through retreat into solitude and contemplation far away from the noise of this world. Augustine primarily engages these people in books six through 10. These people, as we will see, were for Augustine tragically prideful and merit our pity much more than our scorn. Third place, even within the largely Christian confines of North Africa, Augustine found many interlocutors to contest him. There were the Donatists, after all, whom we heard about before. Um, by the time the City of God was written, this dis the Donatist dispute um, had begun to recede in import. Uh, you remember, after all, Marcellinus had helped with that at the Council of Carthage in 411. But even so, Donatism convinced Augustine that the church needed to admit frankly its constitution as a mixed body on the way to salvation, not a fortress of righteousness against an irredeemably sinful outer world. Fourth, there were the Pelagians, initially a small group of Christian intellectuals, at least uh, as educated, as, at least as educated and at least as elite as Augustine, who found his vision of the nature of human sin and the need for divine grace theologically confused and spiritually and psychologically distasteful. Fifth, behind or alongside all of these, there are his fellow Christians, elites who get his literary illusions and ordinary believers in the pews, people who would probably never read the city of God, but who might hear their bishop or priest quote it in a sermon as containing the wisdom of that great Christian sage, Augustine. Especially as the book goes on into the latter books after book 11, Augustine was most afraid, it seems, of misleading these people into thinking that they could trust him to do their thinking for him. Now, part of the power of this book in its own time and thereafter lies in how it heard all of these diverse worries and how Augustine's sheer rhetorical and argumentative genius uh, braids them together in, his, in its pages. They're all constantly there. And while their appearance may become unmistakably uh, present only on a few occasions, they are continually influencing the course of his argument, kind of the way that dark and distant celestial bodies affect through gravity and their gravitational pull, the orbits of planets that are visible to the naked eye. Most basically, on the principle of never let a good crisis go to waste, Augustine used the sack of Rome to rethink the meaning of Rome itself and to address fundamental themes of civic life in general, and thus to rethink all of history. What was more, he used it to offer a new vision of just how exactly Christians ought to and ought not to be worldly. As the letters from Marcellinus and through him that man Volusianus make clear, Augustine understood the pagan suspicions of the Christians, and he knew that they were not entirely unfounded. After all, scorn of the world as flesh waiting to rot was a popular trope across many schools of ancient philosophy and religion, and certainly you can find some Christian thinkers who seem to say things like that. Many expressed a powerful longing to flee this world, and this was popular among Christians and others in his day. And he spoke back to this longing in turn. We see all of this in a remarkable sermon of Augustine's, one that may mark his earliest response to the sack of Rome. It seems to have been preached in the spring of 411, so not even, you know, we're talking maybe like eight, nine months after the sack. And here is Augustine's nearly immediate response to the sack, and it anticipates many themes that we will see much more developed in the city of God. First of all, Augustine insists that physical suffering and death are not the greatest evils. And if you think they are, you ought to meditate on the sufferings involved in hell. God uses historical traumas the way farmers use threshing floors, he says, to sort out the blessed and the damned. And so we should see suffering as training us so that we must learn to use suffering aright. Second of all, Augustine urges an attitude that is neither nostalgic nor ancient Rome, about ancient Rome, nor apocalyptic about the sack itself. The fall of Rome is not a world-changing event, he says. The human condition has been the same ever since Adam and Eve left Eden, and no matter what the political situation, these facts about our condition will remain relevant until the end of time. Anyway, Rome perished while Alexandria, Constantinople, and Carthage all stood. 
All we can say, says Augustine in his sermon, is that Rome is perishable, as Virgil reminds us, no? So even the pagan sage Virgil knew this. Indeed, the, the sack wasn't actually an annihilation. Rome was corrected, but was not destroyed by this violence, he says. Furthermore, there was no golden age of Rome. And this is really where he's getting kind of punk rock, because the Romans really had this almost genetic sort of propensity for nostalgia, where they looked back on everything older as being better. But no, says Augustine, there was no golden age of Rome. We should reconsider Roman rule and the empire it has gained. For him, an empire was a fact about the world. And in truth, it was a much, as much a theological as a political fact. He was by no means unqualifiedly horrified of empire. Uh, after all, he believed God wills that there would be empires. The Bible says this about Egypt, Syria, Persia, Babylon, for instance. There's every reason to think that Rome somehow fits this mold as well. And all empires are eventually held accountable under God's sovereignty, for every empire eventually believes its own PR and falls into the idolatry of self-worship. Empire gives people a taste for ruling, and the taste easily becomes addictive, so that empire becomes its own self-motivating factor, uh, expanding the empire for nothing more than empire itself. This theological interpretation of empire gives Augustine tremendous critical leverage, because now the argument between pagan Rome and Christians is not between belief and unbelief, but between rival forms of believing, rival frames of the absolute. The problem with Rome was its fusion, its confusion of this worldly political order with ultimate transcendent meaning. But that politics can be misused doesn't mean that it can't be rightly used. So the sermon reframes how and why Christians should care for the world as a whole too. And this last point is going to be crucial for the city of God, for, after all, the pagans' challenge to the Christians went far back beyond the sack of Rome. The pagans effectively doubted the Christians could ever care for the world at all, not just politically, but more broadly even still. The Christians, they thought, were always seeking to look beyond this world to another one, and thus devaluing it. Augustine returns to this concern so often in the city that I suspect he thought this was their most profound and most interesting challenge. Um, for it was, from one perspective, not entirely incorrect, but from another, it was the thing about Christianity that the pagans got most disastrously wrong. The title of the work, The City of God, is meant to bring all of that to the fore, to suggest a kind of complicated relationship between creator and creation between eternal and temporal. Now I've said already that Augustine was a rhetorician and rhetoricians are deeply sensitive to the construction of persuasive arguments. And that all of that it includes the title of the work and it continues in the first word even and the first sentence of the work as a whole. First is the highly important use of the word kiwitas, kiwitas or city. Uh, Really, for Augustine, um, he would have used, he could have used more common words like kingdom or people or family, regnum, populus, familia, which also have more biblical um, pedigree. But instead, he chose one of the most central political terms of the entire pagan Roman world. Kiwitas is a Roman concept. Uh, the one which echoes in the Greek world, politeia, would be the Greek version of it. And therefore, it is, if, in a broad sense, Greco-Roman, but certainly and overtly a pagan, worldly political concept. The Roman government habitually understood itself as controlling a homogenous space or terrain, but as coordinating a collective, a diversity, a plurality of cities. And that may seem strange. But consider the only visual representation of the empire from the empire that we have. It's really actually a 13th century copy of it. It's a map called the Tabula Putingeriana, or the Putinger table, as it's anglicized. 
And you need only to glance at it to appreciate how the Roman political imagination could flatten the diversity of landscape on three continents, that is what you're seeing in front of you, to accommodate a vision of the empire as an extended network of cities and roads connecting them. To us, it looks less like a topographical map, a map of space, uh, and much more like a subway map. Okay, but this is the, the central part is the Italian peninsula, right? There's the, the, the heel of, and then the instep, there's Sicily and all of these other things. And uh, here would be Northern Africa and, and, uh, and Europe. And these various different places are all kind of flattened out. The Romans fixation on cities is, is what is especially remarkable here because cities were a relatively small part of their world Somewhere between 80 and 90% of the population of the empire worked on farms, and probably more than that in North Africa. Uh, today, by comparison, in our world, only about 2% of people work in agriculture. And since 2006, for the first time in human history, we, humanity, have become a majority urban species. Only in 2006. Look at that. The wealthy then lived in cities, but also in the country, and they would, have, they would come to town for political and social life, and then would retreat again to their villas during plague season and the long hot summers to live the life of simple, healthy Republican virtue, cultivating and cultivated on the land. Uh, those who were stuck in the cities year-round, the poor, prostitutes, people who worked in trade, were often considered unfortunate and suffered high mortality rates. Cities, in other words, were places where you went for power, for fame, or for death. Avernus, the Roman land of the dead, is envisioned as something kind of like a city in Book 6 of the Aeneid. Um, so Romans both loved and feared their cities. To be in one was to have a greater chance of, at glory and also to be at greater risk of death. But dangerous as they were, cities were things, were, were where things happened. And in all of this, of course, the Romans were doing nothing but following the Greeks, who were so deeply urbane. Aristotle's definition of a human being is a politikons doon, which literally means a living being, a creature, an animal that lives in a polis. Um, that's, this is a phrase that uh, it really obscures what it, what it purports to illuminate. And what do I mean by that? I mean that uh, it would have been more accurate to translate the phrase as a citified animal or an animal who lives in cities, a politikons doon, uh, it's oftentimes what it's translated in English as a, is a man is a political animal, but that really doesn't signify what it means. Indeed, you might say that for the Greeks, real humans are urban creatures and humans not at least loosely connected to cities, uh, exiles or barbarians are not properly, pro properly fully human at all. Now, while they were worldly spaces, cities were also deeply religious sites, homes to the gods as well as to humans. Most shrines and temples were located in cities, as we've talked about a lot in this course. Neither Roman nor Greek religion was really a nature religion like Celtic Druidism. Um, now, of course, many of the gods, most of the gods even uh, don't live in the cities per se, but they visit them all the time. They are, that's where their shrines are, their temples are, and that's where they would go to kind of take up residence. But for Augustine, cities are also not just part of the theological foundations of empire, of reality. For him, the whole world is ultimately, properly speaking, urban, even now. Rome is represented by him as Babylon, not just inside its walls, but wherever its imperium extends. And all sinners, wherever they are, are wandering the streets of Babylon. And the eternal city, Jerusalem, that is the native city of the saints, and um, all of those who are members of the church who are on their way to salvation, that is where they are residents, of course, even if they've never been there. So just as the Romans offered a urban politic for rural countryside, so Augustine wrote an urban theology for a primarily rural audience. And he wrote a Christian urban theology, which was strange. Some people, like the Greek Christian theologian Eusebius, a century before, had baptized the language of empire as a legitimately Christian term. 
But the language of city was far more central to pagan political thought, Greek and Latin alike. So Augustine's use of this phrase, kiwitas, was in its context noteworthy and even a bit jarring, like someone today saying the Republic of God. Undoubtedly, Augustine wasn't totally unique in using this metaphor, but he did use it in ways that were unprecedented. The image of the destiny of the blessed as a city is in the Bible, but in more complex and ambivalent ways than the wholehearted endorsement of city life would make clear. After all, who is it that founded the first city? Cain, after killing his brother Abel. Augustine defines a city as an intentional community, a polity, city, society, whatever, a people bound together by some tie of fellowship. And we saw that actually in the letter with Marcellinus. He uses this definition, in fact, to disagree with Cicero, who thought a city was an association united by a common sense of right and a community of interest, that is, a city is formed by a common sense of justice. Augustine thinks this definition, Cicero's definition, is much too stringent. Cities pursue different ends by different means, and they have different understandings of peace due to their different loves. The city is therefore a theological community. Augustine borrowed a great deal on this idea from the earlier Donatist thinker, Tychonius, who wrote a text called the Book of Rules. And Tychonius there talked about the two cities in a pretty literal way, as you would expect a Donatist would be wont to do, very literal. Uh, while sometimes Augustine uses the cities in a way that is like this, he typically avoids dualism. The city of God is not contrasted with, say, the city of the devil, but with the earthly city. Like Tychonius, Augustine thinks the church is a real city, a real community formed by love. But unlike Tychonius, he did not think this city was perfectly visible on earth. It is incompletely manifest in the imperfect lives of its members. Realizing its incompleteness in one's own and how that incompleteness would should chasten one's vehemence about our world and one's pride about one's place in it is one great lesson that Augustine's urban theology would teach. But we cannot avoid the city's relationship with its ultimate destiny, he thinks. So the city of God is at once an ecclesiastical, a civic, and an existential work. It is ecclesiastical in how it elucidates the inner nature of Christian communal life, what it means to be a Christian among others, trying to live out a life of fellowship and inquiry. It is civic in how it describes the real value and dangerous idolatries of this worldly politics, and how it elucidates our real duties to the civic order, and how those duties can be overridden by other duties. And last, it is existential in how it explains theologically why we live in this world and what God is doing to us in and through it, and how we ought best to inhabit this world in response to God in order most clearly to hear God's voice and receive and share God's love. Now, if the title of the work makes a certain kind of surprising claim and sets Augustine up to argue against Cicero, the great philosopher of Rome, the first word of the first sentence tells his readers that they will engage in a similarly serious disputation uh, with Augustine as he disputes with Rome, uh, the greatest poet of Rome, that is Virgil. Uh, the first word of the work is gloriosissimam, meaning most glorious. Indeed, the whole first sentence of the book is really just a rhetorical, you know, tour de force. Let me read it to you right now. Most glorious is the city of God, whether in this passing age where among the ungodly she lives by faith, or in the stability of her eternal home, which now awaits patiently, until justice is converted to judgment, but which she will then fully obtain in final victory and perfect peace. This is my work's theme, done for my purpose to you, to defend her against those who prefer their own gods, most beloved son, Marcellinus. A great and arduous work, but God is our helper. So many of the master themes of the whole book appear here in kind of embryonic form in this one sentence. The tension between time and eternity, the tension between the obscurities of this worldly justice and ultimate divine judgment, 
The role of believers is patience in waiting for these tensions to be relieved at the end of time. The impu impudence of unbelievers who prefer their own gods, suggesting a bad and shallow kind of agency, this language of preference, and the need in all things, but most definitely in writing this book, and you uh, might say in reading it, of God's help, a plea to God, which is also at the same time our opus arduus et magnus, a quotation that actually comes from Cicero, uh, from his work, The Brutus. Uh, uh, Cicero's last and greatest argument about the importance of rhetoric. Above all, though, shines that first word, gloriosissima, most glorious. If the political imagination of Rome was an imagination of cities, the Romans' imagination of the good life is organized centrally around glory. Every Roman male longed for glory. The recognition of his countrymen for his great deeds, which would give him the only kind of immortality that Romans sought, persistence in cultural memory. Whatever Romans did, however far they went from Rome, in all their labors and striving to bind together Europe, Asia, and Africa into a single harmonious imperium, they did all of this centrally out of a longing for this glory. Laudis amore omnes trahimor ad magna. We are all drawn to great things by a love of praise, says Cicero. Now we may think that glory is a fully legitimate Christian term, just like we might have thought that about the city of God. But in Augustine's day, glory, like city, had powerful pagan undertones. Gloria traditionally described the aim of those who sought to gain renown, to be truly great, to be admirable, to be praised. As such, Gloria was a pagan term, a lot like, we might say, good PR. It shines the light of heroism on its possessors, but it's shined on them by those who witness and remember their deeds. It is not, therefore, in pagan Roman understanding, a self-generated reality. It is a matter of recognition by one's peers. Christians in Augustine's time and before worried that attributing Gloria in this sense to God would make God seem to need human recognition. Besides, who is God's peer? No one. And so in the several centuries leading up to Augustine, the Latin word Gloria was held at arm's length by the churches as not properly Christian. It was only immediately before Augustine that the Latin theologians began to talk about Gloria as a quality of God, something not bestowed by observers, but recognized as emanating from within the uh, essence of the divine. Um, to start the work with Glorio Sissimum, therefore, was to trail a red cloak, not just to the Christians, but to the pagans as well, and especially to pagan readers of Virgil. Virgil's Aeneid was more than a great book for the Romans. It was something like a moral, spiritual handbook for the Imperium, a yardstick by which their worldly achievements could be measured. And a mirror for the Roman soul to teach it what it should care about, how it should care about it, and why. In the first paragraph of his book, therefore, right after the fantastic sentence that I just read for you, Augustine starts this debate explicitly by contrasting a line of Virgil's that is meant to guide the Romans, the famous line, uh, parcare subjectis et debellare superbos, to spare the proud. I'm sorry, to, to, to spare the vanquished and subdue the proud. He contrasts this, Augustine contrasts this with a line from the epistle of St. James describing the character of God who resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. And that is a tacit criticism of the swagger that Augustine thinks oozes from Virgil's line, and therefore from the whole Roman political ethos. And therefore, part of the contest of the city of God from the first paragraph is going to be about whose sense of gloria is the right one, the Romans, spoken from the perspective of a conqueror, or the Christians, spoken in the person uh, who has received grace from the Almighty and all-merciful God. What is the nature of the ultimate glory of this world? Is it the mercy we enact or the mercy God gives us and the humility that we in turn return to God? 
We can also see that Augustine was driven to this approach by positive theological motives. There is a deep Christological and incarnational conviction driving his appropriation of this pagan Roman language. For just as the flesh of our fallen world could bear the weight of glory, that is the incarnation of Jesus Christ, for Augustine, so too the fallen world, the fallen words of cyclum, that is of this world, this era, can bear God's sanctifying meanings. Indeed, our fallen words are still, in fact, haunted enough by their true longings that they are somewhat prepared to bear those meanings. In the same way, like as we talked about in an earlier lecture, Greek pagan myth, even though it is myth, uh, contains some fractured part of the divine story uh, that would ultimately find its fulfillment in Christ. Augustine's rhetorical argument then, therefore, beginning with kiwitas or with gloriosissimum, pick your potion, is in a way a conveyance of the whole methodological point of the book in those single words, showing that the best, the real essence of what the Roman, the Romans sought after in their ideal, uh, in their idealism. Uh, ultimately only finds its true fulfillment in Christ. Now, we've seen the challenges that Augustine faced and how profound they were, but he used them, facing them head on from the very beginning of the work and making their skepticism part of the energy driving the work as a whole. Um, but never forget that Augustine intentionally and pur purposefully dedicated this book to a man who was executed by the state unjustly, and despite all the good service he had done for it, that will leaven our sense of Augustine's vision of what the civic life can do. And with that in mind, I now want to turn in the last portion of our talk for today uh, to, uh, to the opening book of the work, book one, and, and to enter into um, the great topic that he takes up in that opening book, that is the question of suffering. Of course, as he will say, it is only through suffering that we enter into the city of God. Augustine begins the city of God with a five-book engagement uh, with Roman expectations for this worldly happiness. He uses the occasion of the sack of Rome to contrast Roman pagan and Christian responses to suffering, for he thinks he sees in this a very revealing difference in their understanding of the world and our place within it. He focuses here on the civically minded Romans over the possibility that the happiness of human life might be found centrally in this world, and that we can, as it were, build some sort of secure fortress of felicity in history. Augustine thinks this is tragically mistaken. Suffering is so pervasive in our world, so powerful in our own experience, and so perplexing and vexing to all our expectations that any belief in our hope for secure happiness in this world is always a delusion. The question for Augustine is, once we see that suffering is unavoidable, what are we going to do about this fact? Now, before we begin, we should recognize the distance separating us from the world for which and in which Augustine wrote. It behooves us then to think about the ways it is both like and unlike our own. Our world has two ways of imagining the ancient world, Greece and Rome. On the one hand, there is the imagination that we were bequeathed by the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. Here, the classical world is one of grandeur, magnificence, calm and order. Uh, what is relevant about the difference between this world and our own is that Christianity is missing from it. And this is the, the vision that sees the coming of Christianity as a collapse, a catastrophe, the coming of the Dark Ages. Rome is like us, except without the burdens of monkish superstition imposed on us by the Dark Ages of Christianity. Edward Gibbon is the greatest proponent of this view, but it's still one that is common and uh, one that one hears often. But there is another view. And on this one, the classical world is not just like modern Europe, except without the churches. It's not bourgeoisie civilization. It is a world of unbridled passion, 
divine enthusiasms, madness, great cruelty, and great achievement without, uh, without moral scruples. There's no simple way for modern people to reach around their Christian heritage and shake hands with Cicero or Marcus Aurelius. This is, of course, the view of Nietzsche, who was a classicist before he was a philosopher, and one who indicted the educators of his age for failing to grasp the psychological profundity of the classical world and the way that they were trying to grab its flowers, its blossoms, without reaching down to seize its deep psychological roots. For Nietzsche, Christianity is not just an optional thing for us, a light cloak we can throw off and return to our classical origins. The centuries between us and Augustus and Cicero have made us into very different creatures altogether. There's no going back. There's no rebirth. There is only going forward in full cognizance of all that has made us. Now, this Nietzschean view is obviously far more correct, uh, uh, a far more correct appraisal of things than the Gabonian view, particularly in the following fact. The Romans were not like contemporary secular thinkers, at least not entirely like them at all. Uh, they were deeply religious, deeply passionate, and they had a morality that was real, although much of it we would find I hope, terrifyingly inhuman. Um, and that word choice is telling, for in our bourgeoisie self-satisfaction, we find it hard to imagine a way of life as radically different from our own as what these sources seem to think is true, and to still recognize that, uh, that uh, their way of life as a human way of life. The Roman playwright Terence famously is report, reputed to have said, humanus sum, nihil humani a me alienum puto. I am a human, and so nothing human is alien to me. Augustine would, of course, known this line. But is it true? Do we want it to be true? Murderers are human. Sadists are human. Hitler, Stalin, Mao are all human. Are there limits? to our humanist identification with one another? How far can we really identify with people so radically different from us? Or are they so radically different from us after all? We'll return to this question again and again in, these, uh, in this and tomorrow's lecture, directly and indirectly, because Augustine himself had to think a lot about this question. For now, let us just keep it in mind and understand the following two facts about the Romans, both Christian and pagan alike, which make them simultaneously like us and unlike us. On the one hand, as we'll see, they fully understood religious and metaphysical skepticism. The elites of Rome were just as able as we are today to imagine that religion is uh, a bunch of stories made up by people long ago, stories whose human origins are forgotten in time. On the other hand, they had a vision of moral order and purpose that we would, as I said, I hope, find shocking. Uh, pagan Romans were very comfortable with extreme violence deployed publicly. When Augustine talks about the theater, he's not talking about people putting on Shakespeare or Thornton Wilder plays. He's talking about sex shows and snuff films performed live and on stage. And this is only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to what the Romans were willing to countenance in the way of morality, both public and private. It is important to understand this because it will help us to see Augustine's engagement in these first five books as an engagement with the most common aspects of Roman popular culture. After a first book that starts as explicitly about the sack, but then moves into deeper questions, he'll take the next three books to really explore the moral character of Rome, what the people were taught to love and what to fear, and the political consequences of that vision. The picture of what Rome truly is uh, emerges from these pages, and in many ways, it is a terrifying one. Now, as I said, Augustine begins book one with the most direct response he offers to the immediate challenge posed by the sack of Rome. The question of the inequity of unmerited suffering and what we are to do about it, therefore, takes center stage. Here he talks directly about the sufferings experienced by the inhabitants of Rome during that sack and 410 and answers pagan accusations and no doubt Christian worries 
that the sack itself was evidence against the Christian faith in the providential care of a loving God. The core of the pagan challenge had been quite frank. The Christians are responsible for the sack of Rome, they said, and all the other calamities associated with the decline of Rome because they have taught their adherents not to care for the city, and they have so insulted and abused the old gods so as to cause them to desert their posts, as it were, of guardianship over its walls, to, to lose the Pax Deorum, the peace of the gods. Well, to this, Augustine replies in three ways. First, the Roman gods didn't protect its, their devotees. Second, the Christian churches were protected, which would be odd if the old gods were the ones offended at the Christians, and they were still active. And third, the question is itself confused. The key is the character of wrong attachment to the world. And the question should be to what use we put suffering, not who we can blame for it. Furthermore, he says, the history of Rome itself reveals that calamities far predate the Christians. In Book 2, Chapter 3, for instance, St. Augustine writes, Let him recall with us, therefore, that, that is, let the pagan recall with us the many and diverse calamities by which the Roman commonwealth was consumed before Christ came in the flesh. Rome wasn't so hot before the Christians, in other words, and Augustine will spend the next few books explaining in detail, using the pagans' own favored historians, how very, very much this is true. This is, uh, as I think I've mentioned before, my whole dissertation was the interaction between one of the early pagan Roman historians, Sallust, and, and the use to which he is put by St. Augustine in the City of God. Um, before we get there, though, Augustine has a more fundamental question to take on, a question that haunts his entire career and will definitely reappear throughout the whole of the City of God namely the problem of evil and of suffering and the general ill fit, we might say, of between our moral expectations of the world and what the world provides. Augustine addresses this issue in terms of, on, uh, of, his specific, of, uh, of this specific event uh, of the sack, and also more fundamentally as well, asking why on Christian terms does suffering happen? And then Augustine asks a second question, what ought humans to do when such sufferings are inflicted upon them? These are all obviously questions of vital importance for every human being. Let no one ever tell you that St. Augustine does not take on big things in the city. So let's dive right into it. Suffering. Everybody suffers. In Augustine's world, suffering and death were ever-present realities, much more than they are in ours, in fact. Many infants died soon after being born. Many women died soon after giving birth. And at any age, an infection on Friday could lead to the grave by Monday. Furthermore, suffering was inescapable. Not only was it an age without aspirin, without Novocaine, without anesthesia, it was also an age without refrigeration, with a scent of rot, the smell of decay was ever present on the streets and in the houses, feelings of pain, cries of suffering, the sight of grief, the scent of death gave everyone a taste of the inevitable fate that awaits us all. This is all common to our human condition, but it's at least unclear why people suffer to the degree that they do. And it may well be clear that people do not suffer in fa fair ways, that is, some good people suffer a great deal, and some very nasty people get off more or less scot-free. What can we say about suffering then? This is not a question Augustine could hide from, and he doesn't. In Book 1, Chapter 9, he puts himself to the question directly, why do good and bad people both suffer? And he answers straightforwardly that it is because we all, good and bad alike, improperly love the world. As he says, good and bad are chastised together, because both alike, though not in the same degree, love this temporal life. No one is righteous. No one properly appreciate, appreciates the world as it should be appreciated. As Shakespeare put it in Hamlet, if every man got what he deserved, who would escape a whipping? And because of this, all find suffering in their interactions with the world. Well, if that's so, what then? How do you respond to a world that seems immune to your wish to avoid suffering? 
Should we conclude it's absurd? If so, what should we do about it? This question resolves itself in this book into a long discussion of a fundamental issue brought up by the sack and by important moral exemplars in Roman history. Namely, is suicide a sin? Is life worth the effort of living? This is not a question local only to Augustine's age, of course. Uh, when we are faced with the apparent absurdity of the world, just to bring Hamlet back into it, uh, to be or not to be, that is the question, isn't it? And the French existentialist writer Albert Camus uh, put it frankly in the myth of Sisyphus, uh, Sis Sisyphus, there is only one truly important philosophical question, and that is suicide. And by the way, for all of his atheist, existentialist Frenchiness, Camus actually wrote his master's thesis in large part on St. Augustine. But suicide is a perennial question, a question of how we are to endure a challenging life. But it's also one that has a particular purchase on Augustine's age, you see, because in pagan Rome, suicide did not at all have the opprobrium that most of us associate it with today. It was very much like Japan in that regard, you know, where it's not really seen as a, uh, of course, it is looked at as a painful thing by one's family, but it is not looked at as, as one that is filled with sort of opprobrium and, and horror in the same way that it is looked at in Christian cultures. Um, in fact, the, the rates of suicide in Japan are, are, are incredibly high. In fact, I do believe they are the highest in the world and, and always are, uh, you know, year after year. The Romans honored some suicides in very much in the same kind of way. Uh, Christian Augustine wants to explain, though, why Christians are, uh, and humans in general should think of suicide as being never acceptable and how suffering is to be endured, not avoided through self-annihilation. He concludes this discussion by talking about what he insinuates is the uttermost form of cruelty, the cruelty of convincing another that they are complicit in their own annihilation, particularly through rape, and thus causing themselves to kill themselves. Augustine's answer is not theoretically tidy here. He doesn't propose that if we see the world right, the problem of suffering will simply go away for us. In fact, if we see the world aright, according to Augustine, a great many things will become even more puzzling to us. But before we can get to that, Augustine thinks we must inspect the pagan attitudes towards these matters to assess their plausibility and to see whether we need to expel their assumptions from our own minds. First of all, as I said, understand that the Romans saw suicide as eminently acceptable, at least in certain circumstances. It was quite possible for life to become an unendurable, morally or physically, and if that became the case, it was wholly reasonable to seek to escape it. In fact, the blood of select suicides was a crucial ingredient in the metaphorical mortar of Rome. Uh, in particular, Cato and Lucretia, the classic Roman heroes, the alpha and omega of Roman Republican history, were both suicides who sacrificed themselves for the good of the city, at least on Roman Republican memories terms. Lucretia's rape led to the expulsion of the kings of Rome in 509 BC, and thus the beginning of the Republic. Cato, on the other hand, by his death, signified the end of the Republic. Both of them were memorialized as noble and brave heroes in subsequent Roman memory. But Augustine revises these accounts and uses the examples to reveal deep tensions and contradictions in the pagan values they meant to celebrate. Lucretia died clearly as a response to social shame, he says, and Cato died clearly out of a childish spite so that the Romans killed themselves, according to Augustine, out of fear and shame on the one hand and pique on the other. We should consider Augustine's assessment of both here, for it is really quite a radical condemnation, and it culminates in the suggestion that suicide is the end, the goal of the earthly city as a whole. Augustine sees this is ultimately the world, suicide, the thing that reveals the true core of the earthly city, what it amounts to and what it tends towards is ultimately self-destruction. Let us see how. <laughs> 
For the Romans, Cato's death by suicide was not a momentary and impassioned act of despair. It was a cold, calculated, and deliberate act of supremely significant political speech. Uh, it was a way of expressing contempt, contempt of a life to be lived in servitude, which is all Cato saw coming with Caesar's uh, inevitable triumph. Let me just explain what, what happened here, basically. So at the end of the Republic, Cato uh, was kind of the arch enemy of Caesar. And after, he, after Cato was defeated at the Battle of Thapsus in North Africa, he retired to the city of Utica. And there uh, he spent the evening discussing philosophy, the immortality of the soul with his sons. And as they left, uh, he took out his sword and fell upon it in the in the Roman manner, falling onto his stomach and impaling himself with it. And of course, the, the guard heard the dying groan. And so he rushed in, they called the medics and they took out the blade and they stitched him up. And then when they talked to him for a little while, felt he was you know, good enough to go to sleep, uh, they left and he then opened up all the stitches and disemboweled himself, uh, a man who really wanted to die. Um, but he did so. The idea was that because he refused to grant Julius Caesar, the ability to say that I, I forgive you, you know, uh, he refused to live as a slave in his imagination uh, to Caesar and rather want to die in Republican freedom. Uh, and just to show you what a potent memory that has cast all throughout Western civilization, there is still a libertarian kind of wacko think tank uh, in Washington, D.C. called the Cato Institute, named after him, but that's kind of a negative example. But even more uh, positively, uh, during our own American Revolution, um, every winter, George Washington, or at least the winter that George Washington spent at Valley Forge, I guess that would be 1777, I suppose, um, in, uh, in Pennsylvania, he had performed for his troops, for their entertainment and their kind of morale, a play ab about Cato's life, a dramatization of Cato's life that had been written by an Englishman named Joseph Addison, in which are the lines, my one regret is that I have but one life to give for my country and give me liberty or give me death. So Patrick Henry and Nathan Hale both cribbed off of that play in their moments of death. Um, and, uh, but you get the idea. Okay, you get the idea. So for the Romans, they looked at Cato as being this extreme heroic kind of person who took his own life because living under Caesar's domination was unconscionable. Um, it was unworthy of, uh, you know, Caesar's Rome was unworthy of Cato's continued habitation. And it put all who survived him and all who understood his act and admired it in uh, St. Augustine's view, in a nearly impossible bind, for basically it was saying the real Rome, the Rome of liberty and virtue, is dead, and all who would live in that city would have no habitation in the flattering and unctuous town that Caesar now ruled. Well, if someone agreed with that assessment, which is what St. Augustine basically says you have to agree if you're going to look at him as a hero, uh, then you're basically saying that uh, anyone who agrees, any, anyone who admires Cato will, should have also killed themselves, and at least uh, those who were alive at that time. The depth of their admiration stood in mutely eloquent rebuke to the continuation of their lives as Caesar's servants. Now, this is ironic because Caesar would have let Cato live. He was really annoyed at the fact that Cato didn't allow him to uh, illustrate his clementia, his clemency on him. Caesar just wanted a kind of desultory or, you know, kind of perfunctory respect that um, uh, no one really took seriously. And he wanted that because he knew that such pretense, once admitted into the soul, tends to drive out all sincerity and authenticity. But that was just what Cato would not countenance. And by putting himself beyond Caesar's costless mercy, he showed both it and the man who sought to bestow it to be fraudulent and the conditions in Rome that led to that man's rise to be the deepest betrayal and defeat that the res publica romana could ever suffer. A powerful statement. But for Augustine, Cato's suicide gives another message altogether. Cato committed self-murder out of childish spite. After all, Augustine notes, Cato was fine with the thought that his own son, whom he loved, would live on under Caesar. But this meant that he could accept that a life lived out under that reign would not be worse than death, 
uh, for his son. And if that is so, if he thought it was, it was better for his son to keep on living, then why did he kill himself? For Augustine, the answer can only be he killed himself out of spite for Caesar. So again, this is, it's hard to kind of emphasize enough to overstate just how punk rock this kind of condemnation is. It would be like, you know, I mean, at this point, I, I was about to say it would be like making fun of any of our founding fathers. <laughs> the only problem is that in our culture nowadays, our founding fathers and, you know, Davy Crockett and, you know, Wyatt Earp and you name it have all been so demonized anyway that it's, there's nothing left to be punk rock about. But this would have been, you know, Cato was, uh, you know, held in such high esteem that to put him down like this is really quite radical. Uh, and compare this behavior, Augustine goes on to say, to that of another Roman hero held also to be a great man from the good old days, who uh, Regulus. Uh, Regulus promised his Carthaginian captors during the first Punic War, when he had been captured in North Africa, that if they sent him to Rome with peace terms, he would return to them with the Roman's answer. And so the Carthaginians agreed, they released him, but made him swear an oath that he would indeed return, which he did. And he, and he went to Rome uh, and presented the terms, and then in front of the whole Senate, argued virulently against accepting those terms. And whatever you do, don't give in. Don't give in to the Carthaginians. We've got to fight this war, and we've got to win this war. And he won the argument, and look at what he did. Despite the pleas of his children and everybody else in Rome, he pushed them all aside and walked back to Carthage, went back to Carthage keeping his promise, though knowing that he would definitely be tortured to death once he returned, probably uh, in ways that couldn't be imagined. And Cicero actually tells us that he died by being put inside of a coffin, basically, where stood uh, st standing up straight, where there was nails punched in from hundreds and hundreds of nails, sharp nails punched in from the outside going in. Uh, and so that he could not lean on any one place inside of the coffin and, uh, and uh, uh, mortuus es non dormiendo. He died by being deprived of sleep. Um, compare this, St. Augustine says, to Cato the Younger. Regulus had a gruesome death to look forward to, and yet he still went there and died to keep his promise. Cato, on the other hand, appears as a coward trying to avoid whatever unniceties might have existed for him in the future. Lucretia, for her part, is an even more complicated figure in Augustine's retelling. She was the victim of rape, so I'll just tell you briefly this story. Um, at the, uh, this is told to us in, in the historian Livy, uh, at the very end of book one of his histories. Uh, Rome at this time was still a monarchy in its earliest period, the so-called regal period. And um, there was a man named Brutus Collatinus, and uh, he had a beautiful wife named Lucretia. And uh, one night while Brutus was out with uh, the other soldiers, other generals, engaging in some war, beating up on Rome's neighbors, uh, they were, the officers were sitting around at the fire and drinking, and uh, the topic of the relative merits of their wives came up. And uh, everybody, of course, the more they drunk, began to protest even more colorfully that they had the most virtuous wife and as the evening went on and they got more and more drunk they decided to put this to the test and so hitched up their togas and got on their horses presumably there were no laws in those days against drunk riding and they rode around to each of their houses and lo and behold what did they find that their wives in their absence were doing exactly the worst possible thing any roman matrona should do having wild parties in their absence uh, all except for one when they came to the house of brutus they came inside and they found the virtuous Lucretia sitting alone with her ladies in waiting, stitching wool for the children's clothing. And of course, everybody had to give the palm to, to Brutus and say that he had the most virtuous wife. Um, all except for one. Uh, the son of the current king, whose name was Sextus Tarquinius, we are told at this moment by Livy, was overcome with an unnatural lust for the virtuous Lucretia. And he decided that at some point, he would come back in the future and ravish her. And he did. Uh, and when Brutus came back, he happened to have also been there with his father-in-law. They found Lucretia uh, crying, totally uh, you know, hor you know, horrified and, and depressed. Couldn't get out of her finally what they did and what happened. And of course they said, well, look, you've done nothing wrong. But she said, no, 
and, uh, and she ultimately fixed on the decision to kill herself. And that one event so incensed the Roman nobility that they overthrew the monarchy and created a form of government in which no one man would ever have supreme power, the Republic. And this supposedly happened in 509 BC. So in Augustine's retelling, uh, the lesson of Lucretia is a tragic one. He's, he recognizes that rape could be a soul-destroying thing. But what Lucretia does, in his opinion, is that he, uh, he says that she usurps the role of judge and condemns herself to death for being raped, which she deemed to be adultery. The Romans who idolized her, Augustine says, must choose between affirming that she was right to put herself to death and thus would be calling her an adulterer, or denying she was right to put herself to death and thus would be implying she was an illegitimate self-murderer. Augustine's point here is not to condemn Lucretia, but to condemn the twinned vision of honor and shame that lies suffocating at the heart of the Roman attitude towards women and, uh, and indeed towards men too. In fact, it's quite a radical condemnation of one of the founding mothers of Rome and the ideology that she was meant to represent. One quick aside here, before we leave Augustine's immediate critique of the Romans, note that this is the first example of the kind of critical engagement that one will see in Augustine and will see him returning to it repeatedly in the first 10 books, namely what is known as an internal critique or sometimes called an imminent critique. Um, throughout this account, Augustine uses Roman stories to argue against the morals that the pagan Romans generally sought to draw from those stories, which serves to help us understand the kind of argument that Augustine most typically uses. Now, obviously, he would have been taught this in his rhetorical training, this concept of the imminent critique. An imminent critique is a critique launched not as an attack from outside a system of belief, but an insurgency from within it. It accuses opponents not of being wrong or evil or insane, uh, but of being inconsistent, even hypocritical. You say X and you say Y, the critic proposes, but how can you say both? Or you say A, but you act quite clearly as if you believe not A. So which is it? Uh, this is imminent critique. And the meat of it here in this situation is what does the traditional Roman response to suffering amount to? In short, for Augustine, evil is to be endured so long as there was some logic to enduring it that made sense, um, such as the end of Rome, the glory of Rome, gaining glory for oneself. This is how Augustine packages uh, this, this Roman way of thinking. This is not his opinion. This is how he says that is what the, the Roman response to suffering amounts to. You should suffer only insofar as it makes sense for kind of gaining glory for oneself and thereby for Rome. But when it came to unendurable suffering, suicide might be acceptable in the Roman mind. Augustine thinks this, is, this approach in its proposed behavior and in the assumptions that it sponsor it, he, said, he thinks that it deeply misconstrues the nature of our world and the character of our responsibility to ourselves and indeed to the God who made us. Suicide is never an acceptable response to challenge for Augustine. It is, it is never a coherent strategy of escape or avoidance. And, and Augustine was never one for avoiding anything. In contrast, consider how Christians should deal with the victims of rape. Of course, this account, Augustine says, is not so much concerned to answer the attacks of those outside the church, um, but to administer consolation to those within the church. He explicitly here draws on the idea of consolation, and yet the contrast between the Christian and the Roman accounts are revealing. He addresses the victims of uh, the Christian victims who were raped during the sack of Rome by the Goths, and he acknowledges their temptations towards despair and possibly even suicide arguing that, first of all, the violation is not, in fact, one that God will hold against them, but rather God suffers with them. And secondly, the response of suicide would be nonsensical, not really a response at all, but merely a perpetuation, really an extension of the evil that had already been done to them. 
affirming that when physical violation has involved no change in the intention of chastity by any consent to the wrong, then the guilt attaches only to the raper and not to the victim. Those are Augustine's own words. He insists that the violation is not a moral fault of the victim, but rather a psychological trauma. The people uh, who suffer this, therefore, have not actually uh, sinned in any way. The problem, of course, though, is how to respond to the traumatic experience in the best possible way. He knows that such traumatic violations of selfhood and agency may tempt one to finish the job, as it were, to collaborate with the attacker and destroy the self. But he just rejects this simply. The proper response is not to answer evil with yet more evil, but rather to attempt to transcend it, to seek to reaffirm the good. And as a first step in this direction towards doing this, victims of such horrendous depredations should think two things. First, that their actual integrity has not been violated by their attackers. And second, that insofar as they can, and here their particular capacities are crucial, and the advice is very tentatively given, they should attempt to see the, attacks, the attack as a further moment in the long and painful process of God weaning them away from an excessive attachment to this world. That may seem to be an unbelievably hard bar to ask of a rape victim. And it may seem um, that Augustine is, is uh, you know, being perhaps too harsh here even, but he's clear that he does not want to, to, to be understood in that way at all. He's worried a great deal about masochism actually, and the, overwhelm, the overvaluing of suffering as seen in the desire for martyrdom that we've talked about before. And what he's trying to do here is something, something else entirely. He's trying to help the victim find some way to recover agency and make good come out of the suffering that they have endured. To face suffering and not flinch or try to escape it by suicide is simply to face the destiny that God has granted you. Let anyone who desires to come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me, says the Lord. Some suffering you deserve for what you do in life. Some suffering may be a medicine that helps heal you. And some may be offered to you as a chance to glorify God as his martyr. Augustine accepts all of these, but he does not enthusiastically endorse suffering as a simple good, though many in his world may have. Uh, that's an important point to make. Suffering you never want to think about suffering as a, as a positive blessing for yourself. Suffering can be made instrumentally to be good, but it is not intrinsically good. And that is the core of Augustine's own account of suffering. So the basic structure of the Christian response is simple. Suffering is meted out by God in ways that seem utterly random and illogical to us because we do not share God's point of view. God's work has at its core what is to us the inscrutable mystery of his own will, for Augustine, this isn't a cop-out. What he means is that the living God has a plan, but it's not visible to God's people in its details. So Christians should affirm there is a moral order, but they have to confess knowingly that it is obscure for their under to their understanding. Augustine admits this is not a strong argument, but no one else really has any stronger one. The problem of the ill fit between our moral perceptions and the distributions of pleasure and pain in this life uh, is notorious and universal across any ethical system. If you want to affirm that there is a moral order, Augustine thinks you cannot say it easily uh, is visible on the surface of the cosmos. You must make some sort of leap of faith to affirm that order. What you say is that suffering when it happens is something Christians can acknowledge, confront, and hope at least to comfort, if not heal. The crucial question for Augustine then is, what is the use to which you will put your suffering? How do you respond to it? Blessings and disasters are shared alike by good and evil people. Differences between people do exist as regards virtues and vices, though it is not always easy in this worldly consequences. Um, and to see that. 
And these sufferings invite the wicked to penitence, just as God's chastisement trains the good in patient endurance. That, that is Augustine, and he says more. What matters is the nature of the sufferer, not the nature of the sufferings. As he says, and he gives several analogies for this. Um, if you stir up perfume, it produces a beautiful odor. But if you stir up swamp water and muck, it produces a foul stench. It is the same movement, but yet two different results based on the quality of what is being stirred up. Uh, likewise, the same sunlight that hardens mud melts snow. Um, and uh, in the same way, the same sufferings are meted out to good and bad people alike, but it is the quality of the person itself how they take that suffering and what they do with it that produces the difference in the result. One person can become more bitter. One person can say, I'll never believe in God again. And in fact, from my, my experience talking with people throughout my life, every time I've ever met an atheist uh, or read their works or anything like that, but, or gotten to know one on a personal level, invariably a person always uh, becomes an atheist because of some personal conviction, something that happens, you know, a death in the family that is very, very painful, or some other form of suffering that happens to a person, or some other reason why they choose to believe. It's never a scientific proposition about the world, uh, because science, as I've said many times, has no jurisdiction for anything that is not natural. Science can never uh, uh, have any jurisdiction over the supernatural. So there cannot be scientific proof against the existence of God. Um, but uh, it is the quality of the person. It is what they are disposed to do with that suffering that makes the difference. In offering this proposal, Augustine is offering a version of what we <clears throat> can call the therapy of suffering in two senses. One is commonsensical and one a bit more obscure and questionable. In the first sense, Augustine aims to help us overcome suffering by attempting to recover a sense of our own agency in the face of evil's harms. Here, we primarily acknowledge the negative character of the suffering and seek as best we can to make sense of the wounds that we have endured as things that we have suffered. Suffering is a trauma here that we must try. However, uh, haltingly and imperfectly to comprehend. For the sake of our own wholeness, this is an ongoing and imperfect process, and we must always insist that suffering, while real, is not the ultimate truth of our situation. The second and more controversial sense tries to help us see suffering as itself therapeutic, offering an opportunity to reset our values, discover what we should really care about, and what we have been mistaken to care about too much. Here, suffering helps us by teaching us a positive lesson about the value of our release from excessive affections or wrongly attuned attachments to the things of this world. We are too proud, too attached to something, and our suffering teaches us to hold it more lightly as not truly part of who we essentially are. As he puts it in book two, chapter nine, in this universal catastrophe, the sufferings of Christians have tended to their moral improvement, end quote. As to the sufferings of pagans in the sack of Rome, he can see no way in which the similar thing can be affirmed. In seeing, in seeing it in this way, we attempt to recover and reaffirm the agency lost in suffering. It is thus essentially an empowering strategy. By resisting the temptation towards a static victimhood, we attempt to find in suffering, in suffering God's presence to which we are called to respond. At times, the empowering purpose of this therapy has been pushed beyond asceticism to self-destructiveness, but there's an important difference between humility and humiliation, selflessness and self-abnegation, and this practice should remain available to us. Because of this, we must emphasize that not every person can manage this in the same way, and none of us should assume that we can. It should be understood uh, and undertaken with the utmost pastoral tact and not out of apologetic interests, but practical healing ones. Remember, he says we are talking here more as consolation than as apologetic. None of this aims to exonerate God, though. God's righteousness is presumed everywhere for Augustine. 
but rather it is so to figure out what humans can do, how to respond to such an absurd thing as suffering without appealing to the arid calculus of merit. No, nor should this encourage us to seek out more suffering, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. We don't need to go out looking for more suffering, but what suffering we do encounter, we should seek to use for our own advantage. In this attitude, we might ask, is this really a, an inhabitable place? Is it possible? Is it wise to think like this? It seems to set up life as a complicated and uh, it seems to, to look at life as being whatever happiness, happiness that we can find in life is simply transitory and filled with complex complexities. Can you imagine telling a friend who has suffered the death of a spouse or worse, a child, to try to find some use in this pain? To learn from it that they may have cherished their own now departed loved one too much or wrongly. Augustine does not pretend to have answered or even solved this problem of evil, but has just sketched the outlines of how someone with his philosophical and theological convictions might answer it. And he will return to this topic repeatedly in later books, climaxing in the last three of the entire work on the resurrection of the dead. But for now, we must put a bookmark in it, and I will see you all tomorrow for the next installment of The City of God. Thank you.